Thanks so much. Thanks so much, everybody. Uh, thank you for your patience, especially this morning. I know we're starting a few minutes late. Uh, apologies on our side. We're trying to figure something out. But uh, good morning. Here you are. Welcome to the Centre Universitaire de Recherche en Économie Quantitative, or CIRX, Interdisciplinary PhD Student Symposium on Climate Change. It's been a pleasure for us at Forspace to collaborate with organizers from the Department of Economics, Ola Natishin, and Department of Geography, Planning and Environment, Etienne Gertin, and Alexandre Pache for this event. Nous aimerions commencer par reconnaître que l'Université Concordia est située en territoire autochtone, lequel n'a jamais été cédé. Nous reconnaissons la nation Kanyankahaga comme gardienne des terres et des eaux sur lesquelles nous nous réunissons aujourd'hui. Jojage, ou Montréal, est historiquement connu comme un lieu de rassemblement pour de nombreuses Premières Nations et aujourd'hui une population autochtone diversifiée ainsi que d'autres peuples y résident. C'est dans le respect des liens avec le passé, le présent et l'avenir que nous reconnaissons les relations continues entre les peuples autochtones et autres personnes de la communauté montréalaise. For those of you joining us for the first time at Virtual for Space, welcome. We collaborate with our community here at Concordia University in Montreal um, to make various university research activities, initiatives, and course activities publicly accessible through interactive experiences such as this one. So I'll just note that we are recording and live streaming this session, and I'll put those links in the chat in a moment. As you've already noted, we are meeting meeting style instead of a webinar. So you know the rules, please engage in this space via text throughout with any comments or reflections you might have. And you'll be invited to join into a Q&A session either by raising your hand, or your virtual hand and, and speaking. Uh, our moderator will happily call on you. Or of course, if you prefer texting, there's always the ever trusty chat. We'll be happy to read out your comments as well. So on that note, I pass it over to um, our, our now good friend, Ola Knatishin from the Department of Economics here at Concordia University. Over to you, Ola. Anna, thanks so much. Hi, everyone. Uh, me and my colleagues, Alexandra and Etienne, are delighted to welcome you to the CIRAC Interdisciplinary PhD Student Symposium on Climate Change, organized by Center for Interuniversity Research and Quantitative Economics in collaboration with Departments of Economics, Geography, Planning and Environment, the Loyola Sustainability Research Center, and the Four Space at Concordia University. The symposium brings together distinguished speakers, scientists, and students across Canada, and it is filled with panel discussions, interactive sessions, and workshops that provide an excellent opportunity to learn more about the ongoing research on climate change across disciplines. The symposium would not have happened today without the immense support from the founder and current director of CIREC, Professor Emanuela Cardia. I would like to personally thank Professor Cardia for believing in my initiative. Without further ado, please welcome Professor Emanuela Cardia. Thank you, Ola. It's me thanking you for organizing such an incredible event. And bonjour à tous. Je vous souhaite le bienvenue à cette conférence. Welcome. I want to say a few words as an economist. And, uh, um, you know, we know that economic growth can generate negative externality and free riding on public goods. And in the case of climate change, we may free ride today while future generations will pay the cost. Climate change is an example of market failure. Without regulations, set of inputs to production underpriced, and in some cases, they have close to zero price. While the true social cost is high, it is difficult to convince people today of the cost that only future generations will pay. But we're starting to see the cost of ourselves coastal floods, forest fly, fires, et cetera. It's not an easy problem to solve, and it requires the collaboration of a lot of different disciplines together. And today is an example of something that puts people together to try to address and collaborate together. So questions like, how do we price CO2 emissions? How do we evaluate the social cost? How do we minimize social cost of economic growth? Which technology change do we have to implement? How do we make this change across nations? Clearly, we go from economics, chemistry, engineering, natural resources, um, uh, political science. This is the most inter interdisciplinary question I can think of and requires the collaboration of research, research across all disciplines. William Nordhaus, I remind you, economist from Yale, received a Nobel Prize in 2018 for integrating climate change into long-run macroeconomic analysis and proposed in his novel prize lecture 
Nobel Prize lecture a Climate Club, where club members pay dues through costly abatement, price in CO2 emissions to reflect social costs, and where non-members of the club are penalized with tariffs on exports. He was interviewed by the Washington Post just two days ago. And he said that when it comes to public goods, we need governments and collective intervention, particularly for goods we can see, smell, or perceive its cost. Before I let you, so before I let you start, um, I, I should uh, let you talk because I'm not in, in, in this field, although I appreciate the importance. I want to thank Ola Natishan for econ from Economics at Concordia, who came up with the idea, who has put together an amazing idea and project. And, um, and I want to thank Alexandre Pace and Etienne Guerin from Geography Concordia for the incredible amount of work they did. They've done an outstanding job organizing this conference, and I hope this is going to become a CIRAC yearly event. I should add the room to all of you so you can start, and I want to wish all of you success in your research and career. Good job. Thank you, Professor Cardia, for the warm welcome. So now we turn to today's panel discussion, which focuses on opportunities and challenges of interdisciplinary research on climate change. In the next hour or so, we will learn about the potential of interdisciplinary research and how to create bridges between disciplines. It will be a great panel discussion with amazing panelists, and I hope everyone enjoys it. With that, I would like to welcome our highly distinguished panelists. Professor Pavi Aberdethy from School of Environment, Resources and Sustainability at the University of Victoria, University of Waterloo. Professor Damon Matthews from the Department of Geography, Planning and Environment at Concordia University. Professor Elizabeth Miller, from the Department of Communication Studies at Concordia University, and Professor Charles Seguin from the Department of Economics at Université du Québec à Montréal. We are also waiting for uh, Professor Ether Levesque from the Department of Environmental Science at Université du Québec at Trois-Rivières. Uh, she, hopefully she will be able to join us soon. It's a pleasure to have you today. I would like to begin the panel discussion by asking each of you to introduce yourself briefly and tell us what your research is about. Professor Abernethy, you have the floor. Hello, and thanks for having me here. I think this the program and this idea of having this uh, symposium is brilliant. And uh, I am an interdisciplinary scholar in its all meanings, my background I have masters in both natural sciences and social sciences in actually topics such as biochemistry and public health research. Uh, and my PhD was in social and ecological sustainability in, uh, in focusing on sustainability policy and, and governance from the University of Waterloo. And I am currently, again, wearing several hats, which was already mentioned is that uh, I am a research associate at the Center for Global Studies at the University of Victoria and adjunct professor there in social, uh, public health and social policy, but at, which is on the health side, whereas I'm at the University of Waterloo, I'm an adjunct professor, a research professor at the School of uh, Environment, Resources and Sustainability. But to add to this is equation still a bit more, I'm currently in Finland uh, for family reasons, and uh, I am a senior scientist at the Natural Resources Institute, uh, Finland, uh, doing exactly the same stuff, focusing on uh, like a very broadly understood health impacts of uh, natural resource governance and related to climate change and, and uh, cumulative impacts. And the current research projects that I do are um, varied one of them is just that just got funded was the european union horizon project where there are 16 different partners looking at citizen science and climate change and and more of a there are living labs and we are looking at how communities can collaborate uh, together to to 
to do something about climate change mitigation and climate change knowledge and climate change adaptation. So that's one side. Then there are research projects that I'm, I'm also working on that is, because I have my background, I work a lot with First Nations and Indigenous peoples is also up in the north, um, in both in British Columbia and in, in on the border of Norway and Finland, where I'm looking at, uh, at impacts on salmon and, and salmon loss and collapse and the social impacts on that. And then uh, doing so social, shared shows socioeconomic pathways. So that's just a range of things that are all very interdisciplinary and actually transdisciplinary as well, engaging a lot of stakeholders. So that was a long story, but um, hopefully it captured a little bit. Thank you very much, Professor Abernethy. Professor Matthews. And thanks again for, for having me. I'm looking forward to this discussion. I'm Damon Matthews. I'm a professor in climate science at Concordia University in the Department of Geography, Planning and Environment. Um, my, you know, I come from a scientific background. I was trained in earth and ocean sciences at uh, University of Victoria. Um, I run climate models as a tool to understand climate system, the climate system response to emissions. Um, probably the, the, one of the main focuses, foci of my research right now is around the remaining carbon budget. And so using climate models as a tool to inform estimates of how much we're allowed to emit in order to stay below uh, global temperature targets. Um, but I've also looked at issues around, you know, given that, how do you share this quantity amongst emitters? What are the kind of international equity implications of having a fixed carbon budget? Um, and then quite recently, I'm I, I'm well. Recently, the, the scientific co-director for the Sustainability in the Digital Age initiative, which came out of Future Earth in, in Montreal, and so starting to think more about how digital innovation can be used as a as a tool to leverage uh, faster change around climate and, and other social issues. Uh, and I guess the, the last kind of new emerging thread is is around nature-based solutions, which is a um, receiving a lot of tension in the context of countries and, and the world as well, trying to achieve net zero emissions. And you know, one of the, the ways of reaching net zero emissions without getting to zero emissions is to uh, look at ways to sequester carbon in natural systems. And, and so I think this is an area that actually requires quite a lot of um, that, you know, research in order to really understand the feasibility of, of doing this, um, what role they might play, and also what are the implications for um, I mean, as soon as you start talking about using the land for, for climate action, you need to think about how that will affect uh, all sorts of people, including indigenous populations in Canada. So that is my, my background. Thank you very much, Professor Matthews. Professor Miller. Um, yes, yeah, so I also have an interdisciplinary background in political economics and electronic arts. I am a documentary filmmaker situated in communication studies at Concordia. And my emphasis in documentary making and communication is around participatory practices. So one of my first big interdisciplinary projects resulted in a book called The Art of Participatory Practice. It's called Going Public. And it was um, looking at uh, historians, oral historians, theater and communication studies and thinking through large research projects and how they were tackling interdisciplinary issues and um, solution-based research. Um, so I have been doing climate-based communications for about 20 years, beginning with issues such as water privatization, uh, looking at coastal shorelines, looking at what Damon is exploring, um, nature-based solutions, uh, looking into swamps. Um, my current portal to climate is about waste and I'm developing uh, augmented, uh, it's, a, it's a phone app and it's also an augmented cycling uh, trip throughout Montreal that really looks at what I'm calling wastescapes. You can download it, <laughs> it's called wastescapes. Um, but there's a beautiful quote in my area that says, uh, the platforms through which we communicate should be as biodiverse 
as the environments that we're trying to depict. So I'm really interested in thinking about um, communication across as many platforms as possible, but also in thinking about how communication is a meaningful way to engage people in, um, in, in working together in interdisciplinary capacities. Um, and I also like, um, Pavi, I have a, a deep commitment to, in my field, what's called narrative sovereignty. And so I lead a summer workshop uh, in coordination with a group called Wapakoni, um, where we often look at environmental issues, but we train um, indigenous filmmakers in new technologies such as uh, 360 film or virtual reality. And I'm deeply interested in this concept, even though solution is a sort of mixed word, uh, but solution-based journalism, solution-based communication. So how are we uh, communicating the potential for audiences, for citizens, for people to engage positively, engage at all um, in some of these very complex issues that each of us are addressing in different ways. And finally, I am the co-director of the Loyola College uh, for Diversity and Sustainability at Concordia, which is a hub of interdisciplinary research and education. So thank you. Thank you, Professor Miller. Professor Sigrin. Yes, uh, thank you for uh, having me. Um, so maybe um, contrary to some of the other participants, I, I can't really say that I have an interdisciplinary uh, background, except if you consider undergrad in business and masters and PhDs in econ as interdisciplinary, which maybe most people wouldn't. Uh, although my, my hiring at UCAM is the result of a compromise between the econ department and an institute for environmental sciences that really did not want the same person, one wanting an heterodox economics and the other an orthodox. So Apparently, I, I was able to satisfy both uh, somehow. Uh, so yeah, so in addition to being in the econ department, I'm also affiliated with that Institute for Environmental Sciences, which is really promoting interdisciplinary research. Uh, my kind of disciplinary research is more on uh, carbon pricing, especially the uh, Quebec carbon market, uh, and also uh, carbon pricing in, in federal states and issues of, of uh, eco uh, fiscalism. Um, and the interdisciplinary research is a little bit less directly related to climate change, although indirectly related, uh, relates to uh, agriculture. Uh, I work with a, a lot of people um, in the natural sciences, working with uh, corn and soy farmers in Canada and in Brazil. Uh, to try to see, you know, how, what motivates them to adopt the practices that they have and if we can nudge them towards, you know, using a little bit less of the herbicides that they're using, especially Roundup, which is really popular with the genetically modified crops uh, uh, in, in these types of cultures. Um, and then the other kind of interdisciplinary work I do is related to mining projects in terms of developing uh, indices of uh, social acceptability of, of mining projects. And, and this is especially uh, uh, for Canada, although we've, we've had extensions for Scandinavia, uh, but we haven't really gone to um, uh, developing countries with, with, with this index, but we're currently working with uh, uh, indigenous communities in Quebec uh, to uh, develop a version of the index that would be specific to these communities to see what would be the factors that would make you know mining projects more or less acceptable to these communities. So that's about it. Thank you, Professor Sikin. Uh Now uh, I'm uh, happy to uh, introduce Professor Esther Levesque. Uh, she uh, was able to join us over the phone. Uh, Professor Levec, you have the floor. Hi, sorry for the not being able to join you visually, but I'm really happy to uh, be part of this meeting. Thank you for inviting me. It's exciting to hear the different other panelists, which I don't know personally, but I see connection with each of them from different re reasons. I'm a, really a plant ecologist, classically trained, so at first, I would say um, more one discipline, but uh, by definition, plants are in interaction with everything in the environment. So for me, I am in my my soul uh, an integrative, interactive person in, in how I see uh, the research. So I've worked for more than 30 years in Arctic plant ecology. I'm really specialized in 
how the vegetation is and changes in the north. I've worked from the tree line to polar deserts, and that's my line of study for years already. I collaborate with people who specialize, for example, in animal ecology, how the vegetation influences the animals, how in return also vegetation influences the um, physical environment, permafrost, permafrost stability, um, also the hydrology, the snow, the climate, it's all feedback. And uh, over the last 15 years, I'd say I've worked more closely also in communities, in northern communities. Uh, at first, just by interest of this diversity of landscape, how to study this diversity and collaborating with people in communities was uh, a goal of both sharing knowledge, training people about science and learning about the diversity of habitats. Um, it was very challenging. I learned a lot through these experiences. And now we're developing projects that are like more co-constructed with communities to build community-based monitoring. So I reached back the first uh, panelist here also. Uh, we have people from Wapikani Mobile joining and participating in our uh, adventures. Um, so yeah, I'm a plant ecologist with a very broad view and integrative view of the world. So, uh, and the North is changing and we need to work at uh, changing the way we use the, the earth uh, to, to preserve the way of life of people uh, in the North and elsewhere, of course. Thank you very much, Professor Levesque. And thank you uh, for all our panelists uh, for um, introduction. Uh, so uh, we have great panelists today and we are going moving forward. But first of all, I would like to encourage our audience to ask questions. So please feel free to type them in the chat or raise your virtual hand if you prefer to ask your, uh, your question in person. I will now hand over to Etienne. Thank you, Ola. Thank you uh, to our five panelists. Uh, so hi, everyone. My name is Etienne. I'm a co-organizer of this conference, and I'm pleased to be the moderator for uh, this uh, panel discussion this morning. Uh, first of all, I would like to, uh, to say that uh, it will be, if you have questions, it will be easier if you ask them in the chat, because we don't have a lot of time. So it will be easier to keep track of who has questions. Et uh, pour les francophones uh, dans l'audience, vous pouvez poser vos questions en français et il, il me fera plaisir de uh, faire la traduction pour uh, nos panélistes qui ne parlent pas français. So uh, I'm going to start with uh, uh, this first question, um, which is about interdisciplinary disciplinary research. So um, interdisciplinary research is complicated uh, in itself. What are the major challenges that you have faced in collaborating with disciplines outside your own? What strategies have you used to overcome them? And if you have success stories, uh, please share them. So if any of you five have something to uh, say about this, feel free uh, to speak. So should, should we raise our little hands or how do you... Um, you, I think you can just, since it's only five of you, I think you can, we can manage without that. So please go ahead, Shao. Okay, well, I, I'll, I'll say something that's maybe of interest to, to the econ students, which I think there are probably many listening, is that like, one of the challenges of the of interdisciplinary research is that, you know, other disciplines don't necessarily know what really your discipline consists in, and they have often, you know, misconceptions about what your discipline is. And I've found that to be, maybe it's true of all the disciplines, but from the point of view of an economist, you know, you always realize that, you know, people don't uh, really necessarily understand the nature of the research that's going on in economics nowadays. And they often, you know, contact you in research project late in the development of the project because they realize, oh, it would be nice if we could put some dollar figures in whatever we're doing, right? So it would be nice to have an economist who could just tell us, you know, oh, this is worth this many dollars, right? Because this is, you know, what they think economists mainly do, which is economic impact assessment, you know, which is, you know, what some people do, but not what most people do. Uh, so I guess the, my advice on that is, you know, there's a lot of things you uh, should feel comfortable saying no to because you get contacted too late in the process of development of a project 
and you won't be able to bring you know something meaningful in terms of your your discipline uh, because it, it's a bit of tokenism you know it may I don't know if people remember, but back in the days of the Harper government, you know, all the projects needed to be justified in terms of economic, you know, impact and whatever. And then, you know, everyone was on the lookout to have an economist on the team to put some dollar figures on whatever they were working on. So, I mean, that's that's one point. So I guess the solution to that is, you know, you need to get you be involved in projects early on, you know, to really contribute, you know, what uh, uh, the way you're working in the disciplines uh, from the start of the project uh, and not try to join projects maybe too late just to uh, add some numbers that, you know, people need to get the funding, the funding accepted. Thank you, Shao. Uh, that's, uh, that's a good point. Yes. No, uh, I'd love just to add to that because yeah. it's a social scientist because I think that any social scientist who's ever worked in transdisciplinary or interdisciplinary research, my background is much in transdisciplinary research, is um, uh, with natural scientists may have experienced that you are expected to be the one who is doing the communications or uh, facilitation because that's social and it's it's um, it's very I, I I couldn't highlight more that that the fact that uh, that uh, be very explicit of, of what you can and what you you cannot do from the get go and just ask what you have what people are expecting you to do because oftentimes people come with a lot of assumptions and they don't realize that and we don't realize that our assumptions are wrong so I just wanted to to support that and be aware that we really don't understand each other's research fields methods mechanisms questions. And it's really important to get all the interest parties that you want to engage to the planning process from the get go so that you collectively discuss and figure out what your research projects is about and what each of you, what, what, what your role is. And, and I'd like to uh, throw one more thing there as well is that we use same words for different things. And, and in ideal world, we would have a lot of money and time to discuss what the different concepts mean. But in the real world, we often don't, but it's important that at least the key concepts that we're using, um, we de define and discuss. So we, we don't even need to agree on them, but at least we understand what one another is meaning. And I'm throwing one example in here is that social learning in public health is something very specific that you learn from some other people's behaviors, oftentimes role models, that's social learning. Whereas in environmental studies, it's a completely different type of learning. It's learning together, it's mutual learning and listening. So, so just that kind of concepts that we use to share very early on, as I said, we don't need to disciplinarily agree on them because that would, probably take too much time, but at least the main concept in any project need to be um, defined together and understood. So that, that was one. And the third one I had was that uh, um, it's oftentimes important to try to add into the funding proposals some money for that initial collaborative meetings and workshops if possible, and even have facilitators, professional facilitators to help us to understand each other better because we are really, um, we don't realize how disciplinary we are until we start working with other disciplines. So that was just mine. That's really wonderful how you both have set up these key challenges, which are terminology, language, the assumptions that we have to work through that often take a lot of time and patience with each other. I think the anecdote I often use about language is um, in my field in communication studies at Concordia, I sort of jokingly tell students that our entire program is about power. And I make a lot of assumptions about what that word means. Um, but when I've taken that into uh, engineering uh, or another discipline, how I'm using the word power. And when, when I say it, I'm talking about social relations, like who has power in the act of representation. 
they're thinking about that very basic word in such different ways. Um, but I wanted to actually address the second part of the question, which was um, thinking through uh, contexts in which environment, in, in, in which um, interdisciplinary learning can be, excuse me, research and learning can be really successful. And I think there's some really beautiful uh, precedents of bringing together people on land, on water, like kind of using place or site as a pretext and a context to bring together different disciplines who would approach a specific place from very different ways. So we've seen, for example, the artist in residence in a lab, or we've seen um, five different disciplines on a, a biology research boat. So I was thinking about um, some of these really successful models of residences and how uh, what it does is it gives people an opportunity to be outside of their um, their own lab or their own realm of comfort and each individual having to kind of engage with that newness. And the last thing I was going to say is I think um, a, a big part of what I'm and, and I guess what I wanted to end with is this idea that um, finding the things that we have in common is a really important starting point. So it's like, what do we similarly care about? Because it's very easy to get into how we're all very different and splintered, especially in academia, since we come from such specialized areas. But really taking the time in the beginning of a project to establish what do we care about? What are the things that we, we all do have in common so that you can refer back to that um, when things become challenging or contested? Thanks, Liz. That, I think that's a really nice um, summary of some of the ways that, that you can move forward on this question. I, I actually had a kind of a, a challenge that I've encountered recently that, that I actually don't have a good resolution for yet. Um, you know, it's you know, it's something that doesn't get talked about a lot, and so maybe that's part of the problem. But it's it's about like academic publishing, basically, and differences in academic publishing norms across disciplines. And particularly, you know, I come from the scientific discipline where, you know, there's a lot of students who are kind of working, you know, individually or together, but, you know, there's, there's kind of a basic expectation that there, those students will co-publish their research with, with a supervisor. Right? And the supervisor will be in, involved in, you know, shaping and directing and assisting with the research and, and the training. And that, you know, one of the successful outcomes of that supervisor student relationship is a co-authored article that gets published in the peer reviewed journal journal um, and then you know to the extent that at the at the level of grant agencies evaluating evaluating you know science grants the you know the idea of co-publishing with your students is seen as a as a really important piece of that um, you know a metric of success and so one thing i've learned um, you know fairly recently is that this is not true across all disciplines. And in fact, sometimes exactly the opposite is the case, that the, the metric of success of a supervisor-student relationship is actually for the student to become autonomous as a research, researcher and to publish their research individually. And, and this actually, you know, when, when it comes to supervising, co-supervising across disciplines in particular, um, this is actually a really insidious, well, insidious, it's a, it's a really kind of interesting barrier to collaborative research because, you know, from my perspective as a, as a scientist, I am, you know, I want to, you know, help the student develop their research, participate in that research and, and participate in the publication of that research. And that, that is viewed as successful mentoring in my field. Whereas, um, you know, in, in certain fields of social science and humanities, um, you know, the successful mentoring is actually to do the opposite, or it, at least in terms of just to encourage the student to, to publish their own research and, you know, assist and do all the same things. But, but ultimately not be a co-author in the final manuscript. Um, and, and so that can create a, you know, it's a, it's a source of tension that, that I'm not quite sure how to resolve at this point, um, but it, it is potentially a, you know, an important barrier to interdisciplinary co-supervision that I hadn't really appreciated until fairly recently in my career. Maybe I'll join in uh, to this very rich and interesting discussion that raise a lot of elements I had already in mind. So thank you for all the good input. And maybe I'll move slowly towards the second question uh, without letting the leaders. 
ask the question, but I think uh, time clearly is a big problem. You need time. You need sometimes years to really build the, tr the trust and the understanding between researchers of different disciplines. Clearly, stating uh, the common goals, as was mentioned, is really uh, important, but I also learned over years that the un better understanding over time makes that even this goal evolves. Um, the, also, the needs of often the participatory communities, for example, if you work with the local communities, they themselves, they learn and they uh, desire or, or, or need different questions to be addressed and request from the researchers they know help to move along with that. And for in our project, for example, um, I'm a plant person, and but people wanted to work on water quality of the river. So we we help the community to make contact with other researchers and build um, build the collaboration. I think that the the elements of publication that you mentioned is actually really true, and, and we don't even think of mentioning it at first because we don't know those differences across disciplines. I think that's very important to raise up front. And with that, the, all the the way how the, what is the support that needs to go for these uh, initiatives, uh, it needs to be recognized how, that it is um, it is heterogeneous. It is not all everybody the same, and it's not all calculated the same way, rewarded the same way. And, and the time that is necessary in, involves a lag in, for example, the graduation of a student. The student that walks in to, to work in this in between fields will need more time to to um, to get acquainted with the other field and get this work going. And uh, I think this is rarely well uh, taken into account in the evaluations of students also along the way. Um, so I think there are uh, many things linked with this time effort, with this recognition. Um, and this goes all the way to finding a position at the end. You know, if, 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 when we hire someone, we hire someone in one discipline, and and we're really happy that they can do all these. They have this. Uh, I know. So I don't know how you say in English a couteau suisse. You know, how many tools possible to 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 work with others. But we often hire a narrow focus person because we want them to teach this and this basic courses. So, so there's, uh, I think, along the chain of the creating the project of establishing the, co the collaboration, of, of producing the results and collaborating. I think there's many places where um, there are challenges that needs to be named. And um, I think we are at a point where this will happen. Uh, I may just give, a, an. I think the example of the boat was a really good example that was raised uh, by one of the other panelists. I had the opportunities to work on a ship like this and to, it was fabulous um, uh, to be in the ship most of the uh, discussing things with people with totally different interests. They were all in natural sciences, so still very close to each other, but still we had a lot, a lot to learn before we could work together. So yeah, there is definitely a need to improve the way we fund and the way we evaluate these endeavors that I think respond to. Um, real needs uh, and that so it is essential uh, i would just like that one thing um, i think an element that sometimes we don't think about is there is a timing in one's life we are not uh, um, always equal in our needs in, in our ability to take risks to 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 live this delay this time if you have to finish your master in a year and a half as they ask us now or two you cannot take on so much time. A PDF, a postdoctoral fellow, sometimes um, cannot uh, take so much delay uh, in their career. A young faculty member that just got in needs to publish, needs to prove very fast. Someone that's more established can take more risk and more time. Th these are also uh, things to think about. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for those uh, great responses, very insightful. Um, I, I want to quickly address the second question that we sent you because I think it's also very connected to the first one and we were getting there, but I, I, I would ask you to uh, give a, a quick response so that we can also uh, have at least another question before the end of this panel. 
So the second question is, what form of support is needed towards interdisciplinary research initiatives? We've heard a bit uh, of an answer already. But I'd like to uh, have a more complete answer. I could try to jump in. Um, I have attempted to teach uh, interdisciplinary courses at Concordia University and realized how quickly you come up against a bureaucracy that is channeled toward disciplinary practices and that what it requires is, uh, and this gets back to uh, Dr. Levesque's um, comments, is that what it requires is additional work, additional um, work on your own uh, part, but also on the administrative bodies that help uh, make the university and make research initiatives work. Um, so I think just recognizing that participatory and interdisciplinary initiatives are very labor intensive because of all of these elements that we're talking about. And so that we need additional administrative support. We need the support to pilot small initiatives so that we can learn what the quirks are, communicate those quirks and advance them. Um, so even what Damon is talking about, like how do we learn about the different um, needs of our partners, you know, for example, and, and assumptions like for publishing. So these are things that we go into partnerships expecting or wanting. And so, you know, by small pilot initiatives, we can sometimes learn hard. We can learn like the complex things without feeling as if we've sacrificed too much in the learning so that we can then adapt um, larger projects. So I would say money and support for pilot initiatives. And I would also say spaces. I had said the, the boat and the labs before, but I think that we, we need spaces where intuitive and organic um, thinking come about. Uh, so much of our uh, environments are really geared and engineered for these kind of um, monoculture environments. And I think we really need to think outside of that. And this is a super interesting time for that in the, in the aftermath of COVID, how we've completely retransformed our work environments. So I think we're at a very important moment to evaluate how we might shift as we return back. Um, I'll leave it at that. I'd love to build on that because I, you also previously talked about power. And then I think there was also talked about trust and I, I'd like to go more into that softer part because one thing that I think we need to be explicit about is the, which is related to trust, is that when we enter interdisciplinary research projects, we have no way of assessing the quality of our colleagues. So that involves discomfort. And I think we need to become very open and learn new ways of, of talking because we used to just sort of puffing ourselves to demonstrating how, how we can and what we as I have accomplished. But when we're working with interdisciplinary colleagues, we have no way of knowing how the, the rigor of the research and we have to build that trust and accept the discomfort that it because because we feel threatened in our academic credit own academic credibility and professional uh, credentials so that it's okay and that happens that that is that is in in those conversations we all feel when we're trying to learn about develop that shared goal and the working practice and process that's that is there is a discomfort and uncertainty and that's where the trust building is important and 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 accept that that's part of almost every single project so that was just my little throw in there about the trust and the power and a power, natural sciences and social sciences have little power tensions that we also need to be very explicit about in our conversations Maybe just to, to add to these points, I think, yeah, I think, like obviously what helps is, you know, specific fundings for these projects or specific outlets to, to publish or specific recognition of this work. But I think something that's much underestimated is 
is the teaching part because the teaching part can give you a lot of time to get to know and really understand because basically if you co-teach an interdisciplinary class with someone from another discipline well you also became become the student in some way like while the other person is is teaching about the, the material from the point of view of their discipline then you you you're in the best position to really understand you know, the way they're going about it. And then they can also learn from you when you're teaching. I mean, it requires a lot of time because it means that you're, you know, both sitting in on each other's lectures and you're not necessarily, you know, paid in terms of, you know, teaching credits uh, uh, for being in class uh, full time. But, you know, if you see that as an investment that could pay off down the line, uh, as better understanding that person and seeing that there's a there's a potential for working with with that other person you're teaching with uh, on the research project, then you can really benefit because the project themselves are often quite constrained by the funding, you know, and the teaching can allow you to extend the time that you, know, you would spend understand building that trust that uh, was talked about with with someone else from another discipline. Thank you for those uh, very interesting and insightful answers uh, again. Uh, Damon and Esther, I imagine you don't have anything to say about that. All right, so um, we normally have only six minutes left to this panel already, but I propose that we extend it uh, 10 extra minutes so that we're gonna eat 10 minutes of the networking event if uh, all the panelists have the time. And so, all right, great. So I'm going to go uh, forward with the third question, which is uh, about climate change, because this is also about climate change. Um, so the question is, is there any value to the argument that the science is out on climate change and that all we need is the political will? How do you feel about that idea? If And if you do not agree, which area, in your opinion, needs more research in relation to climate change. I mean, I could take a stab at this one. Um, I mean, I think it's it's clear that the, you know, the basic knowledge of climate change is pretty settled. And I mean, one of the big challenges and frustrations as a climate scientist is, is seeing how much that fun, you know, that, that basic contention that climate is change is real, is serious, is caused by human activity is still contended, you know, in the public. I mean, maybe in the last year, we've kind of moved a little bit beyond that with, you know, change in political leadership in the US and, and other things that have happened. You know, and I think the pandemic, pandemic also has been, uh, you know, something of a kind of a push to, to kind of take scientific evidence as being meaningful and real and, and, and important in shaping policy response. And so that that's also maybe something that we take away from the pandemic uh, that can be applied to climate change. Um, but, you know, yeah, fundamentally, yes, we have enough information to know that that climate change is a serious problem that, that requires a you know, concerted and, and, and certainly a much larger political response than we've, we've achieved anywhere in the world yet. Um, you know, when you get into the details of it, there's always things that we don't know, and that that is also partly why you know the the political response has been so sluggish is because you know certain interests have been able to capitalize on the uncertainty in climate science to to reframe that as doubt, and you know uncertainty is not the same as doubt. Um, uncertainty is a fundamental outcome of doing science, and it's not it doesn't you know, certain things are not uncertain and, and and should not be treated as uncertain. But certainly, you know, if you're, you know, really, if you really want to know, you know, how is climate change going to affect hydrological cycles in southern Quebec? I mean, that is not actually a question that science is able to answer very well right now. And, you know, we, we can kind of give a, a a sign of the direction, you know, with some confidence, but but not a magnitude of the effect. Um, you know, even at the at the global scale, if you want to know how 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 much is temperature going to increase in response to a you know, an increase in atmosphere of CO2. We can give a best estimate, but there's about, about a plus or minus 50% uncertainty on that estimate. And, and so there are, there is still work to be done to kind of narrow the uncertainty ranges associated with lots of quantities at the global scale. And also, you know, increasingly as you go to a local scale. And um, I mean, for, you know, for example, to, you know, I mentioned nature-based solutions in my 
um, opening, uh, you know, this is something that fundamentally is applied at a very local scale. And, and so there's, there's a lot of scientific unknowns about, you know, if we reforest a particular area of land, is that going to have any meaningful climate benefit? Is it going to, how much carbon is it going to sequester? Is, you know, is, are there ways that we can adjust forest management practices to uh, sequester more carbon? You know, is, you know, the science of, of climate and forest is, is being used in some parts of Canada to justify cutting down old growth forests and replacing them with fast growing tree plantations, which is a, you know, really kind of a perverse interpretation of the science of climate and carbon cycling. And so there is work to be done still to kind of take the, the scientific knowledge and, and apply it to very kind of specific regional questions that are fundamentally how most people are responding to the climate challenge. I may just add that I totally agree with how this was presented. This is how I was planning to answer also. I think there is plenty information to know uh, is happening and we need to move. We need to, to, to pass to action. Um, uh, but there is plenty of research still to be done to answer specific questions. Uh, and I, 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 in the question you asked for political uh, action, political will, certainly. And I think there is a need for economical will, economical action also. I'll just leave it to others. So I add from the social sciences perspective uh, that uh, knowledge, so I study that knowledge to policy interface and, and societal change and the power, how power influences and without going into further details is more, I wanna highlight the, the, from interdisciplinary to the transdisciplinary, when we start engaging the local communities uh, or politicians or businesses more into working, creating science, um, co-creating science, co-creating knowledge. I think that may be a key piece in also future conversations that, that the people, knowledge in itself is maybe not sufficient, that we need to create the ownership and help um, people feeling that their concerns and perspectives are heard in the ways in when we develop, uh, do new science, but that's a whole different conversation. But I think that's a key piece in, in the future climate change research. So if I can just add something quickly, I think the, I mean, the. For, I mean, I mostly agree with what has been said. I, with the statement, I mostly disagree with the second part. I think you know, the only problem is not just the lack of political will. That's not the only issue we're facing. You know, if I can you know, make an outrageous comparison, I could say like, oh, you know, the science on murder is out. Murder is bad. We still have murder in society, right? So we have a lack of political will to combat murder. You know, I wouldn't take any politicians would go out there and say, yeah, yeah, it's fine. Murder is fine. You know, you know th there are complex issues here. If we can draw a parallel with the Montreal Protocol on the uh, depletion of the ozone layer, you know, they here it was much easier because they were easy technology alternatives, right? So research can go in all kinds of directions. There's much research still to be done to understand the phenomenons at finer scales in certain dimensions, but there's also you know, technical research in terms of substitutes, alternative energy, ways to sequester the carbon. So there's a lot of research to be done, but the only obstacle is not only political will. And it's not, I find that often the fault is put on politicians, but they have to respond to constituents, right? You know, a few, days, weeks back, you know, the Swiss voted against, you know, an extension of their carbon tax, you know, in a national referendum, 51% uh, against, you know, so, so people have to, to contend with that, you know, because if they don't, then they'll be replaced. That's, that's the way the democracy works, right? So I don't think the sole culprits are the, the politicians for maybe the lack of action. I could maybe just jump in again and, and segue to one of the, the, the question about you know insights from the pandemic, because I, I think actually there's a really important insight about political will uh, that we can take away from, from the pandemic is, is that, you know, I think it's fair to say that across the world, you know, politicians found the will to respond to the pandemic in, in pretty unprecedented ways. And, and, and so just to kind of echo what, what Shavas was just saying, um, 
you know, I think one of the reasons why politicians were able to enact that political will was because you know they had pretty whole scale public support for for doing so. And you know, obviously, there's you know there's pockets of of COVID deniers out there, and, and people don't you know certain people really don't like face masks and, and all these things. And then that those people are also the ones that are tend they tend to like deny the science science of climate change. Um, but I'd say that you know the the public opposition to climate action is is a lot stronger than the public opposition to COVID action. And and really, I think this is one of the fundamental reasons why we haven't seen the political will step up. To the level that it needs to be, um, you know, it's particularly salient in. I don't know what's going on in Switzerland right now, but, but yeah, as to why why they would oppose an expansion of the carbon tax, I'm sure there's reasons. And you know, if you look at the Canadian context, federal politicians have to deal with a country that's you know really you know across the country maybe there's 30 percent of Canadians um, you know either aren't concerned about climate change or think it's not not real or not important or so I mean there's it's kind of a you know a relatively minority of, of Canadian public who are really opposed to climate action but you know if you move into the you know prairie provinces that percentage is obviously a lot higher and and so there's kind of a there is a core of the country that's really fundamentally dependent on on the fossil fuel industry and and at a political level this this creates a very difficult um yeah difficult Public opinion, so, you know, divergence of opinions to navigate, and so, you know, there isn't there isn't really a clear way for politicians to be really bold and ambitious around climate change because the public opinion is still so divided. So, you know, if we can get to a place where where climate change is no longer a, a political debate, where it's no longer a partisan issue, where you know the science is accepted and acknowledged, and and we agree that we need to move forward, and then we can start. You know, debating the details of how we move forward and whether you know it's by a carbon price or a cap and trade system or some other mechanism entirely. And those are the questions we need to be debating in society. And that that you know, if we can get to that place, then then we will see kind of progress. I think much more quickly. Um, so I mean, I, I yeah, there was an interesting quote I heard on on the radio at one point. There was about you know the role of activism and mobilizing you know climate or, or other kind of societal change and and. One of the messages was that fundamentally academics need to be speaking to not politicians but to the people in order to, you know, mobilize the the political or the public support for politicians to be able to move forward. And so, I mean, I'm not. I mean, I also don't want to let politicians off the hook. I think we do need people who are willing to kind of push the envelope and not just follow the political or the public will. Um, but it's certainly a lot easier to do that if you have public support. Thank you, everyone. Um, we have five minutes left, so I'm going to quickly jump to one last question. Um, I think we're going to go with um, the, question, the, the question about uh, the relationship between the, the pandemic and the climate crisis, since Damon has already uh, uh, hinted on that. So uh, what are some insights about the pandemic that have changed or reinforced your understanding of the climate crisis? It's last to say on this topic. I think that maybe someone else can go since I just spoke. I can jump in by just stating is that since cumulative impacts is a very important uh, focus of my research, I think that um, this whole in, uh, infectious disease that was probably at least, if not the result, uh, strengthened by the various aspects of a complex social ecological systems that we live in from economy to our um, uh, in income differences and uh, and uh, the ways that we conduct agriculture or some people are forced to do um, um, I'm talking about the Chinese wet markets in this case that were blamed at some point. So I think that for me, the whole COVID crisis demonstrated how we shouldn't be climate focusing on carbon counting and climate change. We should really be focusing fundamentally uh, conducting research that is 
studies the complexity of this all and tries to bring interdisciplinarily all these different uh, fields together because we can't solve the problems by focusing on one issue only it is it's it's economic it is it is more than carbon it is it is so many aspects of this and we need to learn to think in new ways of how we conduct research and how we fund research that is getting conducted and so on and so forth is, is just from studying power relations to studying economics to studying new engineering solutions to studying understanding how nature operates and so on and so forth. So that was just that. Maybe I could say something. Um, so one of the things I think we learned is that there were different stages of uh, public response. So in the beginning, there was this immediate move to help, to support, to do something, to adapt. And that over time, this shifted. And we've seen this similarly in climate um, politics and communication and sciences that when we're looking at an issue over a long period of time, we have to think strategically, even in a year and a half, you know, it, we saw radical shifts of uh, response. And so I felt like I learned a lot about watching the wave of response, even over a year and a half and what we can learn from that. I remember in the early days of uh, the pandemic, um, listening to a, a few uh, feminist economists who were saying, that they had been thinking about certain issues for the last 30 years that were finally quickly rising to the surface, like issues like basic income, and that we as a society were trying them out. And so I think there's this idea that there's a lot of really amazing solutions, again, solutions with quotes, but uh, ideas that can be brought to the surface, if there is, of course, this political will, um, that we need to try out and try on. Um, I think that maybe one of the uh, most immediate things that we saw that we know, uh, but that we saw play out is the inequity of how um, global, a global pandemic and how the climate crisis impacts different communities differently, who is first impacted, who is um, most immediately impacted. I think we saw that where there was social inequity, we saw a lot of trauma and tragedy. And I think that that's something we know that is similar to climate, but we, we need to think together about um, what that means. But I think to end on a positive note with this, a few, these few comments is that I really think that we learned that we can change and adapt. And I uh, had been thinking and have been thinking now for the, the last 10 years very seriously about my own relationship to flying and. Um, international transportation and suddenly I got the gift of it being out of my own <laughs> out of my own hands and you know really just a sort of new norm um, that I wouldn't be moving and it, it actually opened up some really fascinating uh, possibilities for my research uh, in looking deeply in my local environment and I feel very grateful for that um, so I think that we learned we we adapt when we need to and um, that's that's a very important takeaway. Thank you very much, Dr. Miller. Uh, anyone else would like to add something to that uh, question or to that answer? Uh, well, maybe maybe just, just two things. No, go ahead, Esther first. I'm sorry. No, no, go go ahead. <laughs> okay, very quickly, two two things that I think mean, are kind of for me two big takeaways from the pandemic. One is this kind of top-down change versus like individual behavioral change, I think is a really interesting like message you can take from that. You can interpret it in lots of different ways, but you know, we saw, you know, widespread behavioral changes you know, across the globe that decreased global CO2 emissions by about 7%. So, you know, it's unprecedented drop, but kind of not that much given how much people's lifestyles changed. And so it kind of puts kind of some limits on how much individuals are able to solve the climate problem um, and kind of emphasizes the, the need for fundamental structural changes in order to really move uh, further uh, and more quickly. Um, and actually maybe I'll stop there because I forgot what my other point was, but there was something else. <laughs> maybe I'll come back to it if I remember. Thank you.
Dr. De Vec? Well, the, the, clearly there was room for a longer discussion still. I think there's really, thank you for the input. I agree. Uh, there's something really positive about, about the, our ability to adapt and change. But I think um, a lot of work and uh, lots of young generations there, the students that will be the one, the leader doing, making those change happening. So keep at it. It will happen. You can make it happen. I think... Uh, also, I want to mention the difficulty is it's a complex, but I even don't like to say climate change. I, I like to say global change because it's all connected. The, the earth is all connected and the, the, our lives are all connected. I think the pandemic showed that to some degree. Of course, the, the, some people were able to protect themselves better, but as was mentioned before, the more, more vulnerable ones uh, it, it, we realize there's really inequal inequities, and how much do we want to live in an inequal world, inequitable world? Sorry for the difficulty there. I think it's something we need to consider and think about. And I think the pandemic raised that questions. We stayed comfortable in our own comfort, but um, things will keep to change. There will be people that are are in unsettled part of the world because of war or because of global changes or climate change that will happen. This will keep on happening. There will be other challenges. And I think we need to think um, that it's all interconnected and uh, we need to, to act now. And as structural changes were mentioned, it is so important. I cannot believe that when I was a student, we we're discussing things that we're still discussing them. We need to stop discussing and we need to act. Of course, it's very difficult because actions have repercussions that we don't all understand, we cannot all foresee, and will make mistakes. But I think we need to move. We need to move along, and uh, and just um, underline again: this it's all so so social, economical, ecological. It's all tied together. We have to 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 stop this dissecting it in small parts, but looking at it as a whole. Thank you very much, Professor Levesque. And uh, thank you very much uh, for all our panelists for being here today and for making the time in your busy schedule for this event and for such a stipulating discussion on interdisciplinary research and climate change. Uh, we are out of time, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, I also would like to thank our audience for joining us and participating in the conversation and to Anna and to Douglas at the Force Space for their amazing support. And with that, I will end the formal discussion and invite everyone to continue the conversation in more informal settings to the networking platform Wonder. Uh, the link will be posted in the chat shortly. And I would like to remind everyone that at 11.30, we will start the series of PhD students' presentations with Climate Chronicle session, where four PhD students will present their research on climate change. I will pass it back to Anna now. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks, Ola. So folks, we invite you to go ahead and click on that link that's been put in the chat. Um, play a little bit, meet some of the people that are here today with you and have more informal, casual conversation discussion, get to look, you know, meet one another in this kind of space. And we'll just stay streaming here and prep the next group of presenters that will be coming on board at 11.30. So feel free to, if you don't wanna to go to Wonder, we say goodbye to you at this point. We do hope that you check it out and play around in that platform and have a chat. Um, otherwise, I will invite you to take a break mute your camera and rejoin us again at 11.30. We'll use these 15 minutes to set up the next presenters in this space. Thanks, everybody.
All right. So as folks are leaving, and just so you know, you would have to kind of leave the Zoom space um, to go to Wonder and, uh, and then come back for the next session. Please let us know if you're having issues. I will invite the presenters for Climate Chronicles. So Benjamin, Ola, Bubakar, and Bianca, if you're here, please turn on your cameras and we'll go ahead and test your screen share, audio, et cetera. Make sure everything is working well. Uh, Boubacar, would you like to, hi there, would you like to um, practice your share screen or do, do you need to test anything? Okay, no problem. Do you hear me? Yes, thank you. See my screen? Yeah, do you just want to go full screen, make sure it looks good? That's great, yeah. Perfect. You don't have any video or any sound components to your present? No. Nope. Okay. Wonderful. Well, it looks good. Looking forward to it. So you're welcome just to relax in the next 10 minutes and hang out here. We'll see if your uh, co-presenters are here with us. Thank you very much. No problem. Great. Hi, Benjamin. Uh, hello, can I, uh, you want to try my um, screen yeah. sharing? Yeah, let's go for yeah, it. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So. Um, Normally it's okay. Yeah, do you want to just move forward a slide? Yeah. Just seeing a border there. Okay, no, oh, that looks good. Perfect. Okay, perfect. Yeah. And no no video or sound components? No, I have no video, only, only pictures. Easy peasy. Awesome. And great. Okay. No problem. Monica and Emanuela, I, you can just turn off your video uh, now if you wish, because we see you here in the uh, Zoom. I don't know if you want it <laughs> to be seen right now, so just letting you know your video is still on.
Hi, Anna. Hi, Jen. How's it going in Wonder? Well, do we do we have the four presenters here? I'm missing Bianca. So we've tested uh, Boubacar and Benjamin. Everything looks good there. And Bianca's not here yet. And I assume Ola is good to go. All right, so we have Benjamin is here. Um, Bukabar, Bubakar. Um, so Anna, you said that Bubakar and Benjamin is are good to present. Yeah, we're just waiting on Bianca. Okay, Bianca and, uh, was at the the Wonder uh, okay. event, Wonderful. so she should be here. Great. And then Ekaterina. Etienne, are you doing the uh, moderation for this yes. panel? Yes, I am. I'm uh, okay. trying to find Ekaterina. Uh, no, it's me, uh, Etienne. Oh, Etienne. it's you? Oh, yes. OK. OK, we have uh, Ekaterina. There is, a, there is a updated okay. program on the on the Google Drive. Oh, perfect. Make sure okay. you have that one. <laughs> okay. Great, and well, I see Bianca's here as well now. So uh, Bianca, maybe we'll just ask you to turn on your Bianca, did you want to do a quick, quick screen share, make sure everything's working well, or are you confident, good to go? Um, I can, I can do it quickly. I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure it will work, but I can do it right now. Sure, wonderful. Yeah, uh, I think it worked. Yeah, it'll just have to go full screen and look yeah, fine. Yeah, it is fine. Yeah. Wonderful. All right. Again, over to you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Ola, just to make sure that uh, the the only change to the program is uh, your presentation, right? Correct. Perfect. Okay. So, uh, hi everyone. Welcome to uh, the first uh, PhD uh, presentation session of uh, this symposium. Uh, this one is named Climate Chronicles because all the presentations relate to, um, in some way, to uh, the temporal scale of. Uh, climate change and also other actually other stories not related to the temporal scale. Um, so we are going to start immediately with uh, Benjamin Alboy. I'll sorry if I mispronounced your last name. Uh, it's Albui, but no Al worries. Albui. So yes. oh, uh, sorry, just before you start, um, if you have any questions uh, for the panelists, uh, you can uh, write them in the chat or you can raise your hand after uh, the four presentations. Each presentation is 10 minutes. So I ask the, the presenters to uh, limit the presentations to 10 minutes, and then we will have um, 15 minutes of uh, questions and answer uh, at the end. So Benjamin, please go ahead. Thank you very much. So thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for this very interesting introduction. Firstly, I would like to thank the organizers of the symposium for the invitation to give me the opportunity to participate to the debates as an archaeologist. So today I call my presentation Learning Lessons from the Past, Investigating the Impact of Climate Change in Prehistory, the Case of the Last Neanderthal. 
So as it, uh, as it was written in the introduction of the call for submission, climate change is a defining challenge of our time. Even if it is crucial to rapidly develop solutions and work for change in our current societies, it's also important, I think, to consider this issue through the lens of the past. Because through human history and particularly during prehistory, climate change played a major role driving our ancestors around the globe and feed the development of our own species, Homo sapiens. Hence, ecology, with the help of environmental sciences, can contribute substantially to these debates from another perspective, not necessarily very present in current debates. To illustrate this statement, I will present here my doctoral research on the last Neanderthals of Western Europe. I will detail here my methodology, my working hypothesis, and the implication of this research for the current debates on climate change. Finally, I would like to conclude my presentation with some consideration regarding an open discussion of the importance of a diachronic perspective on abrupt climate variability. In this context, a Neanderthal, Homo neanderthalensis, is a key species to study this issue to have a, a very uh, significant example. Because on the one hand, they are the best documented extinct human species to this day, very closely related to our own species, Homo sapiens, like uh, cousin species. On the other end, they occupied a large part of Eurasia, starting around 350,000 years before present, where they survived through several climatic cycles, colder period than today and warmer period than today. And there were a very successful and resilient hominin through other technology that are subsistent and symbolic behaviors. Many studies today show that they, are, they had a, a modern cognition like us today. Despite this significant degree of resilience, they finally disappear around 40,000 years before present during the marine isotopic stage three between uh, 60,000 and uh, 27,000 years before present um, during a period marked by a millennial climatic instability between a stadials period, cold periods and interstadials, temperate periods. And also by the arrival of anatomical modern humans, Homo sapiens from the East. Hence, it appears crucial to investigate the precise impact of one of these events on a human resilience and survival. So I'm interested about the climate perspective of this issue. This doctoral project taking place within the Omenin Dispersal Research Group, HDRG, that involves a multidisciplinary approach to mining ecological and paleoclimatic data through a high resolution paleoclimatic reconstruction special and chronological. After very conclusive results in a more recent period for Homo sapiens in um, 2017, revealing the decisive importance of seasonal climate variation, we decided to apply this approach to the last Neanderthal population from MIS-3. This research is at a crossroads of two approaches is growing in ecology. First, high resolution paleoclimatic reconstruction, uh, which are the most secure data at the continent scale and which permit to have a millennial to annual variability data, so more human data uh, to human scale. Secondly, ecological and species distribution modeling inspired by biological sciences and which the application on the inter gatherers such as are very efficient. And it's also a form of uh, I'll analyze this tool and interpretative framework to uh, better understand the implication of these variability. We have three main objectives in this research. First, to explore settlement dynamics of the last Neanderthal in specific MIS3 paleoclimatic context. Through an innovative spatial and chronological resolution, more human, on a human scale, 15 kilometers meters by 15 kilometers and a seasonal to annual data. Then it would be interesting to compare these population dynamics with those of the first anatomical modern humans arriving from the East at the end of this period. It's another current doctoral HDRG project conducted by a colleague, Simon Paquin. 
to address this issue, a great diversity of contextual predictors will be used. Geomorphological predictors like altitude and slope at a very fine scale, one kilometers by one kilometer. Uh, paleoclimatic predictors, thanks to a collaboration with the Laboratoire des Sciences du Climat et de l'Environnement at Gif sur Yvette, France, with a, a very good diversity of predictors um, in two different simulations, cold and temperate, uh, with um, uh, predictors of temperature and precipitation from annual to seasonal variability, and uh, in a very fine scale too, uh, between uh, 15 kilometers by 15 kilometers. When we will we have access to pile environmental predictors too, thanks to a collaboration in process with the Geotop at UCAM. One of the main tasks of this project is to lead a comprehensive literature review to identify all the Neanderthal settlements known in Western Europe to this day for the MIS-3 and to identify climatic signature for each of these occupation to attribute them to a cold or a temperate phase. Here, this is the first overview of this task, which has been uh, ongoing for a year and almost completed. So we have a very uh, large corpus of many sites to explore this issue and to test our hypothesis. After this data collection, this will be the next step of the project for the next month. The different instances of settlements will then be associated to either the cold or temperate climatic simulation to identify the predictors that are significant to explain Neanderthal settlements during cold and temperate periods. This process will be achieved through a machine learning method called random forest. It's a formal tool to interpret the relation between the different predictors and human settlements uh, to identify the most significant variables and to make habitat suitability maps to interpret them. For example, in Burke et al. Uh, 2017, we have uh, many predictors uh, very significant like um, variation of precipitation during spring or um, maximum temperature in autumn. Here then uh, it will be com possible to compare with ethnographic data on modern anthrogatherers and to have an anthropological perspective regarding the impact of climate change on human evolution like the decisive influence of seasonal variability on plants and animal resources, predictability, uh, which can imply the retreat of the groups towards refugee area during cold phases, for example, or competition for resources with other predators. Our ancestors, Homo sapiens, or other carnivores very present in this time, like INS. So to end this presentation, I would like um, to end with a, a question is, can sciences of the past help us to rethink our own relation to our environment and can help us consider the future? We can be pessimistic on the regarding this question and saying that we are doing that for knowledge for knowledge or like uh, Egel said that history teach us that humans lost nothing from history. But I would like to be more optimistic today um, because we can play a role in this issue, I guess, because we can document the impact of abrupt climate change in human evolution to have in a concrete illustration case study to general audience. So we can not offering solution, but bringing more concrete facts, I guess, from our evolutive history as an educational support for the next generation. Like some of panelists said, that it is important for all the people in societies to better understand this mechanism and the possible impact of human societies that um, were determinant in our evolutive story. And that caused a disparity and extinction of a very promising species like uh, as Neanderthal people. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Benjamin, for this very interesting uh, presentation. We're going to move. Uh, we're going to move to um, Ola. Yes, 
I am here, just one moment. I'm gonna share the screen with you in a moment. Let me just adjust my screens. Just hold on, please. Okay, here we go. All right, do you see my screen? Yes. Awesome, fantastic. All right, so, um, okay, let me introduce. All right, so um, first of all, I would like to thank you for joining me today in presentation on multiple international environmental agreements an alternative approach to tackle climate change. I am PhD candidate at Concordia University in Montreal, and this is a joint work with my thesis supervisor, Dr. Fresini Diamantoni. The objective of my research is to examine stability of multiple international environmental agreements. Why it is important? Because environmental problems can only be addressed effectively through international cooperation. The real recognition of the problem began with the United Nations Conference on Human Environment held in Stockholm in 1972. Since then, several important environmental agreements have been negotiated, such as Kyoto Protocol and Paris Agreement. All these agreements have two common characteristics. They address the issue of climate change and they don't work. Large coalitions are hardly stable each individual country has strong incentive to free ride on the cooperation of the rest. The majority of literature has been analyzing one agreement. For example, Barrett introduces basic model with symmetric countries and analyzes one agreement. It is concluded that under the simultaneous approach, there is only one stable coalition with no more than two countries, which is sad result in my opinion. However, in the last decade, multiple international environmental agreements emerged as an alternative approach to address global environmental issues in form of different treaties, protocol, amendments, and even agreements itself. For example, North American Environmental Cooperation Agreement or European Union Environmental Action Program. However, there were no attempts in the literature to carry the analysis on multiple international environmental agreements outside of the cases of transboundary pollution. So let us have a closer look on the model. So first of all, uh, we assume that there exist N identical countries. It's quite plausible uh, assumption, but also it's the assumption to simplify uh, the model. So we suppose that a set of countries form a coalition and the coalition structure or partition P is a set of all possible coalition that are positioned in descending order. And importantly, that one country, country I, can belong to one coalition only in a given coalition structure. For example, we have, suppose we have 10 identical countries. So they can form a grand coalition or they can form a coalition of two, uh, uh, of the size seven and three, or they can form five coalitions of size two each or any or many more. Therefore, the partition uh, is, uh, is basically uh, the, the set of this coalition. So in this case, you would have three partitions. So what we say is that each country would generate non-negative emissions as a result of its economic activity. So each member of a coalition SJ that belongs to partition P would emit some ESJP, so some level of emissions. The social welfare of each country or profit uh, that belongs, uh, so the social welfare or the profit of country I, of one country that belongs to this coalition within the partition P, is expressed as the net between the total benefits from countries I's emission and the damages from the aggregate emissions. So we consider quadratic benefit function that are increasing at a decreasing rate. And we say that each country suffers from damages that depend on aggregate pollution, including countries' I emissions. So again, we assume quadratic damages such that they, the damages from polluting increase at an increasing rate. We say that parameters A, B, and C are strictly positive. 
So the methodology is very simple. So we apply the concept of non-cooperative game with negative externalities in a partition function form. So in the first stage, each country simultaneously takes a decision on partition, whether uh, on participation, whether to sign an agreement and join the coalition or not. So we suppose that all countries sign agreement, hence multiple coalitions emerge. And since we assume the countries to be identical, we say that every country has the same set of strategies and the welfare of a country depends only on its choice and the set of choices of all other countries. So interestingly, countries cooperate inside each coalition, but play non-cooperatively with each other. So payoff of a country depends on the coalition structure or the partition they are in and the size of a coalition to which it belongs. And if a country decides to join or leave the coalition, it assumes that other countries will not change their strategies. And in the second stage, coalitions simultaneously choose the mission level as in current application. So, for example, members of a coalition, let's say SM within the partition P, choose their emission level by maximizing their collective welfare with respect to its own emissions. And the optimal emission level of a country I would depend on the size of its own coalition and the size of other coalitions. The indirect social welfare would, can be expressed as the net between total benefits and the damages. And the total social welfare generated by the partition P is the total welfare generated by each coalition in the partition. Now, in order to find which coalition would be stable, so in this case, we need to use a notion of stability developed by Aspermont, such as internal and external stability. But let us see some example. So the worth of a country, of any country, let's say a country I, is expressed by welfare function that assigning to each member of a coalition a real number. So each country has a certain welfare as a number. Hence, we say that, for example, coalition S1 is internally stable if there is no incentive for a member of that coalition to deviate as a singleton where when he is given that choice, assuming that all the remaining countries do not change their membership decision. In other words, the country gets higher welfare or higher profit being in a coalition rather than being alone. Hence, if it's true for all the coalitions in the partition, we say that this coalition structure or the partition is internally stable. Similarly, for external stability to be examined, we need, uh, we need a partition to contain at least one singleton. So a one country that didn't sign the agreement. Otherwise, the stability becomes trivial. Therefore, we say that, for example, coalition S1 is externally stable if there is no incentive for a singleton to join that coalition. So when the welfare of a singleton is higher, basically welfare of a country being alone outside of a coalition is higher than when it's joining the coalition. And if it's true again for all the coalition, then we say that the partition is stable. Therefore, the stability concept here does not longer apply to coalition like it used to, like it studied in the literature, but it applied to partition. Therefore, coalition structure is stable if it's both internally and externally stable. This is basically a standard Nash equilibrium approach. So the general result of the paper is that there exists a unique stable set of multiple coalitions of two signatories for any number of countries. So N can be even or odd number. Let me present the intuitive perspective of this result on a numerical example with 10 identical countries. As you see in this table, there exist 42 possible partitions. The ones that are marked in red are the coalition structures or partitions that have been discussed in literature. However, there were no attempts in the literature to carry the analysis of partitions marked in black. So the unique stable partition P37 in uh, blue rectangle incorporates multiple coalitions of two signatories. If we compare this result to the one that have been has been discussed in the literature, for example, in Barrett's paper, partition P41, 
in the red rectangle. One could notice that signatures welfare in case of multiple coalition is higher than in the case of a single coalition. So 110 versus 87. Consequently, total welfare generated by the partition in case of multiple agreements is also higher relatively to the total welfare generated by the partition was coalition, 1100 versus 9 and 10. So in conclusion, multiple coalition formation gain leads to better results in emissions and welfare or profits than single coalition formation gain. Bottom line, it's better to have multiple agreements rather than pursue one agreement that doesn't work. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Olaf, for this very interesting uh, presentation. We're going to move uh, to Boubacar. You see my screen? Yes. Hi, everybody. My name is Bouak Job from University of Sherbrooke. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to present you my work. This paper is a joint work with my thesis supervisor, Professor Martin Opelli, uh, with also Professor Jean Schopp from University of Bern and Angelique Bernabe, a PhD student at uh, Ryerson University. So in this paper, we try to see the long-term effects of uh, cyclones in India uh, on the education and labor market uh, outcomes of individuals when they become young adults. Uh, students around the world uh, regularly face disruption in their education, mainly because of natural disasters, armed conflicts, or a pandemic. Uh, currently, we are facing the COVID-19 pandemic that generates uh, uh, an important education and delay for a whole generation of, uh, of students. In India, for example, it has caused around 50 weeks of school closure so far, affecting over 320 million students and 86 of them were in compulsory schooling. Uh, regular schooling in developing countries can have a big effect on uh, uh, the life of an individual, because given that in the short run, children get nutrition and health support from school, and education also is seen as a tool to combat uh, child marriage and inequalities in these countries. In the long run, education is a determinant of uh, uh, individual's earnings, and in the aggregate, it also uh, contributes to the formation of the human capital. That is a determinant to the economic growth of countries. So depriving uh, these children from uh, regular school can have dramatic impacts on the uh, development process of uh, developing countries. That is the reason why we are interested on in this topic. And in this paper, what we do is to quantify the long run effects of uh, unexpected interruptions in regular schooling in rural and urban India. For that, we use tropical storms as an exogenous shock to uh, assess the impact of compulsory schooling disruption on educational attainment or, or delays and the type of activity performed by individuals in young adulthood. For that, our identification strategy consists in measuring a childhood exposure to storms by constructing an exogenous variation in wind exposure across Burfield courts and districts during compulsory schooling. To do this work, data requirements are high because we both need uh, current income of individuals in terms of education and labor market activities, and also they, their exposure to uh, tropical cyclones during uh, their compulsory schooling. For socioeconomic data, we use the uh, 2018 release of the periodic labor force survey that is representative of the Indian uh, population. And we restrict our sample to individuals aged between 23 to 33. So this sample restriction is mainly guided by the uh, tropical storm data uh, that we have uh, at our disposal. And to give you a look, a picture of uh, what we do, I present here 
the timeline of the oldest cord that we observed. Uh, they are aged 33 in 2018 and were born in 1985. They start primary school at the age of six in 1991 and finished compulsory schooling nine years later in 2000. We include the preschool year given that uh, individuals can also uh, start school earlier uh, given uh, according to the month of birth. So we uh, compute the, the exposure, expo exposure to uh, tropical cyclones uh, during these 10 years of compulsory schooling. In the PLFS, we can have uh, information on the level of education attained by an individual. And here in the table, we have the accumulated years required to achieve each level of, uh, of education. So using this information with the number of years of education reported by an individual, we can compute uh, our variable of educational delay. That is the difference between these two variables. For example, an individual can say that uh, he, he has seven years of formal education, but only completed primary school that require five years. So this person has two years uh, uh, of delay in his uh, uh, educational attainment that can be explained either by repeating grades or dropping out from a, a higher level of education. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot distinguish between these uh, two explanations. That's why we have also an alternative me measure of uh, educational delay. That is an indicator variable that say whether or not uh, the, the person present um, an educational delay. And in the PLFS, we can have also uh, labor market activities uh, where the people, where the individual operate and also uh, hours work and earnings. This figure has nothing to do to tro with tropical storms in India. It is uh, a picture of Hurricane Katrina, but just to say that uh, by having information about the position and wind speed of the eye of a storm, it is possible to have the wind speed on, in all the areas around the eye. Our raw data of tropical storms come from the National Hurricane Cent Center, uh, and we have the best tracks of all uh, tropical storms that happen uh, around the Indian territory. Here, each line is a given uh, storm, and we can have with this data information about uh, the the coordinates, the, the date, and also the wind speed of the eye of the storm at six hours interval. So this information allows us to uh, compute the wind speed uh, at the centroid of each district that composes the, ter the Indian territory. So using this, uh, uh, this data, we construct district level storm index, that is uh, a yearly district, district exposure to storms, uh, 33 here is the threshold that allows to uh, classify a wind as a tropical storm. And it is squared uh, to uh, the square express the force exerted on building structures. So this is the district level storm index that we use to construct our birth year curve and district exposure index. That is the sum of the district level index uh, during the 10 years of uh, compulsory schooling of individuals. So CBD is the exposure of an individual belonging to the birth year code B and living in district D. So that's what we use as a measure of uh, exposure to, of the, to storms for, for individuals. So here we give the spatial distribution of this, uh, this index that we calculate. And we can see that uh, people that are mostly affected are located at the southeast of the Indian country in the territory. So results that we have suggest that tropical storm can create an average schooling delays of up to eight weeks, an increase by 9% of the probability that children is a repeat or a year or dropout, a decrease by 6.5% in the probability to move to higher education and a 42.6 decrease in the probability of accessing uh, regular salary jobs. This results is obtained 
uh, with an instrumental variable approach when we instrument uh, educational delay by uh, the measure of cyclones and we see what happened uh, on the labor market. So to formulate policy advice, we also study the possible channels through which uh, storms affect education. There are three possible channels. The first one is an income shock when individuals lose their job, or if, for example, uh, children uh, exhibit uh, PTSD the, that enables them to attend school. Uh, or also the third channel is infrastructure demolition. So by doing an heterogeneous effect analysis between boys and girls, and also uh, between rural and urban area, we determined that storms affect education through a negative income shock. That's why we recommend uh, a policy in rural and urban areas. In rural areas, we recommend to do cash transfer uh, conditional on kids' school attendance. And in urban areas, we recommend strong social safety nets with unemployment benefits and social assistance. So to conclude, uh, the average age mix delay found uh, taken with the results found by DFLO on returns to education in Indonesia may cause a lifelong fall in returns by 1.3 to 2%. And uh, given that the channels through which uh, storms affect uh, the education of individuals is similar to the channel through which COVID-19 uh, affect also the education of individuals, we say that we can use our paper to uh, assess the long-term effects of this pandemic. So from our results, we can infer that uh, the pandemic will generate significant delays and an increase in the dropout rate. And our instrumental variable results tell us that we can expect a change in the activity type of these individuals once they reach adulthood. So uh, this is the end of my presentation. Uh, Thank you very much for listening and I'll be uh, happy to answer questions if there is any. Thank you, Bubakar. Uh, very interesting. We're gonna move to Bianca for our last presentation of this session. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, hi everyone, thanks so much for uh, letting me present my work. Um, I'm from, I'm a PhD student at UBC and this work is called um, Migration Costs in the Environment. It's a joint work with professors Patrick Bailey and Frederick Nora here at UBC as well. Um, so as we know, uh, climate change causes um, extreme weather events uh, such as disruptions in rainfall and temperature and that compromises people's well-being. Uh, so migration is um, possible and a very important adaptive response to that so people can move away from these areas that are more affected by temperature and rainfall shocks. Um, and it is so important that environmental migrants are projected to be at um, around 20 to 200 million globally by 2050. And we usually think about um, environmental migrants as, as international migrants and refugees um, but uh, the truth is that this, in this projection, more than half of these migrants are internal, so they migrate within their borders. Um, and uh, we know as well that uh, if we lower the migration costs for these people to, to move, they, it could uh, potentially help them escape um, these bad weather locations. Uh, we're looking at the context of Indonesia. Indonesia has a large population and uh, they are relatively mobile, so they migrate a lot internally. Um, and in the country, the rainfall so cycles are important for agriculture and a lot of people are employed in agriculture, so um, it affects them that way. Um, and it also has been shown to be a significant driver of migration. So people migrate a lot because uh, the location they live is dry, for example. So here's a map that demonstrates the, I, I calculate and plot here the um, deviations of uh, historical average rainfall. Uh, so the more red locations are the drier ones. And I plot here two years, a dry year and a more wet year. Um, so it, this is just to show that this uh, weather and this rainfall shocks, this dryness 
Um, they are very spatially correlated, which means that if you live in a location that is dry, it's not sometimes not that easy to escape. So you have to move long distances to uh, to get out of um, of, of of dry location, say. Um, and this is an example of a migration cost. The distance is um, a very important component of migration costs. So the, the further you live from the city you want to go, the more costly it is for you. Another thing that affects the migration costs is infrastructure, for example. So if you have roads, you have public transportation, it is easier for you to move out. Uh, but one thing that has been, uh, the literature has shown to be very important for migration and for reducing migration costs is the presence of social networks um, outside your location. So say you know someone at your destination that makes it easier for you to move to that location and makes it less costly. Um, so in this work, we'll focus on the existence of these social networks at potential destinations as a component of migration costs with the idea that more networks uh, means uh, less cost for migrating. Um, so having that, we ask two questions, basically. Uh, the first one is, how much do social networks help individuals move away from areas that are affected by climate-related shocks, uh, more specifically rainfall in our case? So if it's dry and you know someone uh, there versus if it's dry and if you don't know someone anywhere, anywhere else. And the second question is, does climate migration improve welfare? And we'll measure welfare by consumption here. Uh, so this is just an anecdote for uh, the importance of social networks. This is a photo in a village in Indonesia. They have a statue for a um, photocopy machine, um, which is very important for that village economically because uh, a lot of people migrate out of there to work in nearby cities uh, on the photocopy uh, industry, which is very interesting because they move away. Uh, and once people in that village know people in the nearby cities who work on the photocopy um, industry, they know someone there who can easily employ them in that, in that industry. So it is very important for them. And more, then more people migrate out of that village to work in nearby cities in the same industry. So that, that just represents uh, how the social networks at destination uh, facilitate newcomers into the labor market. Uh, so the data we're gonna use is this very nice longitudinal survey uh, called Indonesia Family Life Survey. They have five ways from 93 to 2014, uh, roughly separated by four or five years. And they follow individuals uh, across time, which is very nice because you can see people across years. Um, so for each individual, they record the location, migration history, welfare, and a lot of other things. Um, in my sample, I have 37, around 37,000 individuals that are followed across these five ways. Um, and that appear in at least two consecutive ways. So I would restrict my sample for that. And uh, our measure of networks is drawn for that data, from that data, and is the share of individuals uh, that migrated out of K, K is the origin location, uh, where they were born until the last year of the survey. So say I live in, in village K, and that person, uh, that, that chair is whoever migrated outside, whoever was born there and migrated out of there um, until four years ago. Um, and the rainfall data comes from, uh, the, from remote sensing and it's a 0.5 by 0.5 degree resolution. Um, and the rainfall measure that we use captures uh, how dry it is. So it's not the total rainfall, we use the, um, uh, the number of months, the average number of months from uh, in between the survey period, uh, where um, the amount of rainfall was lower than the historical average, so it captures how dry it was in, in that in that period. Our empirical approach, the first one uses uh, these measures that I just mentioned to estimate the impact of uh, social networks on rainfall related migration. So we basically run a linear regression, uh, having the dependent variable as migration that is equal to one if an individual I migrated out of that sub, sub district since the last survey year. And we are interested in uh, beta one, which is the coefficients of the interaction between our measure of uh, uh, network and rainfall, which tells us by how much networks help uh, people migrate if there is a rainfall shock. Uh, so here are uh, the results. So this, I just report here um, our, our parameter of interest, which is uh, beta one. Uh, so this basically tells us that uh, if 
we have an increase, this coefficient tells us if we have an increase of one month, if there is one more month uh, that is dry uh, within that period, um, if uh, I know 10 percentage points people more it, outside my location, my probability of migrating is uh, 0 0.1, uh, 0 0.11 percent uh, percentage points uh, more. So it increases my probability of migration, which shows that networks are important. If it's dry and I know someone outside, I'm more likely to migrate. Uh, so the second approach is we run a two-stage least square regression um, to look at the impacts of on rainfall related migration of rainfall related migration on welfare. Uh, so as an instrumental variable for migration, we use the share, the same share, but a fixed one um, in 1993. Uh, and we run a first stage and then the second stage here. And we are also interested in the coefficient of the interaction between migration and rainfall, which tells us uh, by how much uh, migration uh, improves welfare uh, once there is a rainfall shock. And uh, we, this Y is uh, consumption. So why, uh, I'm gonna quickly explain why we need an instrument here for, um, we need an instrument uh, because, um, we're, we want to see this, the impact of this on, on consumption, but also um, we know that consumption also and other welfare measures also impact migration. So we have an endogeneity. So to uh, get rid of this polluted, of this bias, we have to use an instrument here. And that's the instrument we choose. Um, and as you can see here, the, the F stat is, is, um, is good, like it's above 10. Uh, so the first stage is okay. Um, and our second stage, the, we run both on, on OLS and an instrumental variable, and we both get to the same conclusion, which is uh, a positive rainfall shock would, um, if we migrate due to a positive rainfall shock, um, this would improve our welfare. Um, and the explanation for that is that uh, if we have positive rainfall shocks, people can migrate, but not due to a shock, not because it's dry, but because they accumulated assets enough over time um, and if they migrate, they're better off. So it's, it's an investment migration rather than a shock migration. We still have to investigate. This is a work in progress. We're still gonna investigate testing different instruments and testing different uh, measures of, of rainfall. But this is the result that we have so far, uh, which basically is rainfall related migration seem to respond to migration costs that are associated with the strength of social networks and migration seems to improve welfare, giving a positive, not negative rainfall shock. Uh, thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Bianca. Um, so we're going to move to uh, questions and answers. And we uh, already have a question from uh, Bubakar uh, to Bianca. So Bubakar, uh, do you want to ask it um, by audio? Yeah. Um... I was just asking why aren't you interpreting your results as a marginal effect because of the interaction term? Yeah, exactly. Um, I was interested in the interaction term, not on the partial effects on uh, of uh, rainfall or networks. So I'm, uh, that's why I interpreted it this way, because I'm interested in uh, given a shock, how much networks would change um, the probability of my grade. Okay, fine. Thanks. Thank you. Can I ask Ola a question? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, it's a very interesting result of your model. Uh, could you uh, give an intuition for, um, for that result? Why this type of agreements are better? Um, yeah. Sure. Uh, so the intuition here is that we all focus on one agreement to make it work. Well, for example, right now we all focus on Paris Agreement to make it work. So we all have to meet the targets. We all have to uh, uh, comply with the requirements and so on. The problem is that countries are heterogeneous. So they not ever, you cannot compare the, 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 the for example, France and let's say Jamaica, or you cannot compare Germany and USA, right? So in this case, usually what's happening in such a big agreements is that there is a huge incentive to free right. So basically do not comply. To say something, um, 
like I don't want to like want to imply what happened with us before, but uh, to say that uh, we are going to meet certain targets and then never comply with it. Uh, so my result tells that maybe it is better to instead of focusing on such a big agreement and force everyone to comply, maybe it's better to have multiple agreements that address the issue of climate change, that sets the realistic targets, and which have some sort of a compliance because countries can uh, countries do not have incentives to right. So when they say something, when they set a target, they actually comply with the target. So overall, in the end of the day, we have less, we maybe have more agreements to follow on, right? But in the end of the day, we have less uh, emissions and we also have higher welfare. Because from economics perspective, what we, what we look at, not only about how much, how much emissions are in the atmosphere, but also is it profitable for a country to emit or, or comply with the, with the mission targets to basically re, to abate. So if the, if the country finds that it is profitable to actually abate, to emit less, to comply with the targets, then we say that the agreement is stable, that the, 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 the country receives high welfare being in a coalition. So my result leads to, to, to think a little bit different on the problem of international environmental agreements and take maybe a different approach. Because right now we have agreements that, for example, about the water, about um, um, uh, the, the transboundary pollution, right? But we don't have like a global agreement that addresses the uh, in, that um, addresses the uh, the emissions. So I believe that even if we have small but many agreements, it's better than trying to fit everyone in the big one. Thank you. All right. Does anyone have a have a question for any of the the presenters? Uh -huh. Yeah, yes. I have a question for Bubaka. Uh, what solutions can prevent the long-term effects of unexpected interruption in compulsory sc schooling that you show? Thank you very much for the question. Uh, as I suggest in the paper, we uh, uh, recommend some policy advices uh, to, to tackle this issue. Uh, we discovered that with our results that uh, uh, people suffer from uh, income loss or they lose their job. That's the reason why we propose uh, social safety, safety net uh, for rural area, uh, urban areas where people lose their job. And for uh, rural areas, we propose cash transfer, but conditional on kids' attendance to school. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Benjamin, um, I have a question for you. I I might have missed this in your presentation. I don't know if you mentioned it, but I know earlier this year there was research suggesting that the Neand the reason Neanderthals died was because of a magnetic reversal. So the North Pole flipped to the South Pole, and this like destroys the ozone layer or something. Um, have you heard about that? And do you have any insight on that? And what do you think about that? Uh, it's not an hypothesis I, I explored very well because I think the Neanderthal extinction is a multifactorial process. It's it's um, uh, it's it, it will it were caused it was caused by many factors. Uh, I think uh, the the cause that you you talk about can be uh, uh, one of the explanation not um, um, a total explanation. We can have other factors like um, a climatic uh, brutal climate change, the, the topic of my research. Uh, also a genetic problem because Neanderthal was a very um, little population. And with the refugee areas effect, we have like a bottleneck effect. So uh, they had a very a tiny um, diverse uh, genetic diversity. So it can be a problem in long-term evolution. 
there were also the arrival of uh, Homo sapiens and also competition um, with other carnivores like hyenas. So I think uh, we can't consider uh, uh, an only factor, but like um, a multifactorial and to, to weight uh, the impact of it, each of them in their thought. It, it will be a project after my thesis where where I I try to to um, to know the the specific impact of climate change, but it, it could be uh, interesting to have a global uh, project to have to test in a, in the same project these different um, uh, different um, explanation and to 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 involve a multidisciplinary approach to like we talk about in the beginning of the of this uh, this symposium. Thank you. I have a question for you, Benjamin, as well. Yeah. Um, I was wondering how, uh, in, in relation to what you said at the end of your presentation, um, how do you approach uh, the, the idea of applying the knowledge you get from your research on the impacts of climate change on Neanderthals, how do you apply that to uh, the current global societies that are much different? Yeah. Uh, I'm talking about like hunter-gatherer versus industrialized uh, agricultural societies. Uh, I think there is two main points uh, that I would like to discuss about your, your question. Thank you. It's firstly, yes, you're totally right. Uh, I talk about very different societies economically, um, uh, and also um, demographically, uh, but we uh, a certain thing is that um, variation in climate can affect also our um, uh, societies. For example, if we have uh, variation in precipitation during spring, it will be terrible for agricultural resources too. So we can have a link, not a direct link, but uh, we are always affected and more because we are not uh, mobile now. We are not uh, yet an other gatherer. So it's, we have a dependence uh, in climate change, uh, different, but not um, uh, less important. I think it's um, another type of, of uh, dependence. And on the other end, uh, it's, it's um, always hard to, to share our researches uh, to uh, public because we are um, very, uh, specific on very specific topics, so it's it's sometimes hard to to share the results of our researches. Uh, for my own, I had the chance to to have other other works before I, I start my PhD in uh, museums uh, in a center for uh, mediation to the public, and there I think they are the place to share this information and and in in person of, of researchers, we have to do this also effort toward the public to have a more simple things and to, to, to share our information like stories, because I think public are, are much uh, sensitive to stories and, and, and this more than uh, too much um, technical vocabulary or, or technical terms. So I think uh, we have to to, to share also this information, but with other media, also like um, documentaries or like this, this other media. Thank you for your answer. Um, this, is, uh, this concludes the first uh, session. So uh, thanks everyone again for uh, your presentations. And I invite everyone to move to uh, the Wonder uh, networking uh, platform. If you have any more questions you would like to ask to the panelists, uh, you can ask them there. And I'll see you at 1240 at the next uh, session. Thanks, Etienne. Thanks, everybody. So feel free to turn off your cameras, go off to Wonder, um, and we'll invite the folks who are presenting next. I see you're all here, Annabella, Philippe, uh, Pekana, Minoru, if you'd like to stick around and we can test your screen shares, et cetera, while folks are networking. And I've stopped the live stream for the break period also. Oh, good. Okay. Thanks, Dan. Lunchtime break.
Hi. Hi, Annabelle. Hi. How um, are you? How are you? Good. 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 Um, yeah, I wanted. I I wanted to test my. Uh, your sound just cut out, Annabella. We can. Hmm. Doesn't. Something just happened. We can see you, but we've stopped being able to hear you. Let's just uh, mute and unmute you. See if that works, probably not. There you Hello? go. Yep, it's back. No. Uh, I'm gonna sign out and sign back in. I can hear you though. Can you hear me? I don't know why I can't hear. I heard you in the beginning, but not now. As soon okay. as I turn my stuff on, so okay. I'll just uh, I'll come right back. See if that helps. Thank you. Okay. All right, uh, besides uh, Annabella, are the other presenters, if you're here in Zoom with us and you wanna turn on your camera and test your presentation, now's a good time to do that. Okay, I'm back. Okay, I hear you. Okay, I hear you. Great. Um, okay. <laughs> That might happen to me again. I, just, I, I always have Zoom problems. Um, okay, so let me share my screen. And hopefully that's not a problem. Okay, you can see my screen? Yeah, if you just wanna full screen it, make sure it looks good. You can see it there fully. Yep, that's beautiful. Okay. Okay, and that should work. Do you have any embedded video or any sound in your present? No. Nope. Okay. No, which is good. Yeah. <laughs> That's a big issue. <laughs> um, okay. Okay, that works. I'll uh, stop sharing. And, uh, okay. Thank you so much for yeah. testing that out with me. Of course. Yeah, if there's. Uh, we'll let you know if we lose your feed or something as you're presenting, and then maybe that trick of logging back in will work. Um, no stress, we'll yeah. figure it out. But anyway, hopefully everything okay. will be fine. Okay, sounds good. Okay. Yeah, I hope so too. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Hey. Hi, Willie. Uh, so is everyone who's left to present doing it right now? Because I didn't hear any names this time. So I don't see your name on the hot and dry panel. Are you presenting on this next panel? Uh, I don't know who's coming next. That's what I'm saying. Oh, I see. Okay, so the next panel at 1240 is called Hot and Dry. It's uh, Minoru Higa, Pekana, Vinicius, Philippe Cabor, or Cabore, and Annabella Bonada. Okay, so is uh, all panels going to present today or does the groups for tomorrow too? Sorry, could you repeat that? I mean, is everyone going to present today or are there other people scheduled for tomorrow? Yes, there, there are. Uh, there's two, one, two, three. There's four panels, uh, panel sessions today and uh, three tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, Willie Benson, you are, you're tomorrow at uh, 1140. Thanks. Right after me, actually. Okay, good to know. <laughs> Hi. 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 Can I pass my screen? Yes, yeah, of see course. If can share. Yeah. Great. Are you guys seeing it? Yep. Okay, great. Okay. Heat and health. Awesome. Great. Sorry, we got your name reversed here, I think, on the. Uh... <laughs> yeah. Probably like I have some issues with like surnames and sometimes like I have problems with the passport because we have like a middle name in Portuguese. So you always like, I know probably I did some MS up with the, the name somewhere. I just um, allowed renaming. We usually keep that off or, but if you want to fix 
No, I think it's it. it's right here, Douglas. Oh, it's, okay. wrong, it's wrong in the program. In the program. Ah, yeah. that yeah. we can't so easily fix. Oh, yeah. <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. Uh, no, that's, fine. that's awesome. But you're joining us from... Um, wait, no, I have to scroll up. Where, where in the world are you right now? <laughs> and now I am in Brazil. But uh, okay. yeah, I'm uh, hopefully finishing my PhD this year at UBC. At UBC, yeah. Amazing, wonderful. How are, how are folks surviving in Brazil right now? It's, it's, it's a big question, I know, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no it's, it's not, uh, we are not in the, we are not dealing very well with the pandemic, uh, mm -hmm. no, it's the politics side. And mm -hmm. so definitely uh, Canada is doing much better mm -hmm. uh, than here. Uh, we have a like a high level of uh, of deaths every day, and we don't have the political effort to decrease this level. So it's kind of uh, it's hard because sometimes like we try to do and try to like uh, discuss and do our part, but uh, it's being hard to and very sad as well. So let's see. Hopefully, if like the rollout with uh, of the vaccination and uh, things will start like uh, getting better. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah, yeah, and that has begun. It it, it has. Uh, yeah. I think we are increasing in like kind of uh, our our numbers in a fast pace. I'd say uh, not as fast as as it could, as in and and it should. Okay. Oh, did somebody just mute you? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I. Uh, I'm so sorry. I'm trying to uh, not hear the Zoom while being in uh, in wonder, and I thought it would just mute you for me. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> We've been censored. <laughs> Hello there. Hi. How are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm great. Uh, I would like to try my uh, my share screen, if you sure. don't mind. I don't, I don't uh, have you as uh, being part of this next panel, but uh, uh, actually, it's the the following one. Okay, perfect, great. Uh, but I'm such a disaster with technology, so <laughs> I'm taking advance. Okay, wonderful. Um, and I'll just uh, while you're doing that, I'll invite Philippe and. Uh, who is it now, Philippe and Minoru, if you're here, if you can hear me, if you'd like to test your presentation since you're speaking next, that'd be great. Oh, there you are, hi there. Yeah, no, that's looking good. Uh, can you see the, 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 yep, the, the, yep. the slides? No disasters, you're good. Thank you. All right, we'll see you again later on, looking forward to it. Thank you. All right, uh, Minoru, hello. Hi. Hi, how are you? Good, good. Good, did you want to practice sharing your screen? Okay, let's do that. Let me really increase the screen. There we go, I have to share. Share. Can you see the slide? We can, yeah. Uh, okay. see see these little it? numbers above that's really oh that's great i see it it's it's giving us a preview of how many slides <laughs> yeah. we'll get through that's great thank you okay. yeah it's looking good okay. thanks very much and you are joining us from simon fraser right yeah. yes All right awesome Okay, so what, one more shout out to Philippe, uh, Philippe Cabore or Cabal from University of Ottawa. If you can hear me, please join us here. And if not, your presentation will be a great surprise. No worries. All right, guys, so those folks are going to come back from Wonder now in the next minute, and uh, we'll get started at 1240, so you can just 
chill out until then. Douglas, are you going to restart the live stream now at uh, 1240? Yeah, it's actually just starting up now. Awesome. And I've uh, disabled the waiting room as everyone comes back in. I'll turn it back on. Great, thanks. And it's just, uh, just a little note when it's your turn to present, you might want to tilt your camera back. We're, we're just not, see okay, that's good. So <laughs> Perfect, thanks. All right, hi everyone. Welcome back after this short break. Um, this session is uh, called Hot and Dry and uh, all presentations relate to um, uh, whether uh, the climate effect, the weather effects of climate in relation to uh, so many things. So we're going to start uh, right now with uh, Minoru Higa. Uh, thank you. I'm going to start sharing my screen. <laughs> okay, uh, so. I am Nidoru Higa from Simon Fraser University. Thank you to the organizers for the opportunity to present this project, which is called Is It Too Hot to Work? Um, uh, my research question is, uh, what is the impact of temperature on working hours? Um, why this question is important? Uh, because uh, time and climate change are central to our well-being. Uh, so in fact, higher temperatures can change the way we allocate our time to work. So for instance, you can imagine you know, yourself in a very hot day and you may decide, you, you may feel that it's uh, more costly for you to perform your job and you decide to work less. On the other hand, maybe it's, it's warm and nice and instead of working, you decide to go biking and you work less. Uh, so all these changes in the way you allocate your time to work uh, can change the quality and the quantity of the overall labor supply. And in fact, the International Labor Organization projects that uh, due to global warming by 2030, the world will lose an amount of working hours that is equivalent to 80 million full-time jobs. And this will lead to a reduction in GDP of $2.4 trillion. And this, is, this question is important for the developing countries context because they focus or they concentrate 80% of the labor force in the planet. They are also located in tropical areas where climate change is expected to occur faster and with more intensity. And also uh, because the population there is more vulnerable because of the high incidence of asset poor households. Um, so what we know about this question in, in the literature, so we know that for developed countries like the US, extreme temperatures do not affect hours work in general, uh, but this is not the case for developing countries like China and Mexico where uh, either low and high temperatures uh, reduce hours work. We also know that there is some heterogeneity across industries, uh, gender, age, etc. Uh, however, 
We don't know much about uh, whether uh, these effects are driven uh, because these jobs are outdoor or indoor. We don't have uh, very precise estimates for adaptation. We also don't know much about anomalies. So there is no focus on the, on the tails of the distributions of temperature. Um, we don't know also much about self-employees, even though they represent 80% of the labor market in developing countries. And also we don't know much about welfare effects. So in the paper, I tried to address the first four points, but today I'm going to present only the first two. Um, so there are limitations in the study. Uh, so for instance, I assume that uh, people work in the same district where they live, and this is not always the case. I also won't be able to disentangle behavioral explanations. So for instance, it's very hot, but you don't change your uh, amount of working hours because you have to meet deadlines or you don't wanna be perceived as shirking. I also won't be able to capture these uh, shifts in composition of the local labor market uh, due to migration, uh, like uh, Bianca was presented in, in the session before. Um, finally, my analysis is a short run analysis, so I won't be able to speak on, on adaptation in the long run that it maybe is more suitable for, for the climate change context. Um, so the data I'm gonna use, I'm gonna use data uh, for Peru. I'm gonna use a panel, uh, two sets of panel data uh, that cover this period from 2007 to 2015. Um, to answer this question, you uh, actually need two types of data. So you need weather data, and labor market data. So regarding weather data, I'm going to use a uh, reanalysis data from ERA-5 here in the presentation and in the paper, but also in the paper, I use uh, satellite data from, from NASA. Um, and then for the labor market, I use the National Household Survey for Peru. And actually in the map, all these blue dots that you can see are all the households for which I have information. So I see all the individuals within each of these households. And they usually report uh, how many hours they work uh, the week previous to the date of the interview. And since I know the date of the interview, I can know uh, what was the weather like during that week. So I can know the temperature, humidity, precipitation, and since I know their location, uh, I can calculate the amount of daylight hours they face uh, by taking the difference between the uh, sunshine and sunset time. Something important here is that I'm not considering uh, this side of the country, which is the jungle, because apparently the satellite data is not good uh, for this side. But the, that is okay in, temp, in terms of the labor market because uh, this side of the country only represents 12% uh, of the labor market. And so this is my empirical approach. Uh, this is a main specification. I tried different other specifications in the paper. Uh, so here we have uh, my main outcome, which, which is uh, working hours. We have uh, location and time fixed effects. We have other weather variables like humidity, precipitation, daylight hours, some social demographics. Um, then I measure weather in temperature, sorry, I measure temperatures using beans. Uh, my coefficient of interest is this beta. And you can interpret this beta as how much more or how much less uh, you will work if instead of having the average temperature, you have a temperature associated to being gay. And well, here identification comes from presumably random year to year variation in temperature condition or on the fixed effect. And for the indoor and outdoor categorization of the labor market, so, um, for a, for a sector of the labor market, it's easy to categorize uh, because they directly respond a special questionnaire. But then the challenge is to expand this categorization to the entire labor market. And for that, they use machine learning to predict whether a job is outdoor or indoor. And uh, um, this uh, machine learning model use, uses streaming outputs, streaming inputs, which is uh, the task directly reported by the workers, by the workers and also the economic and occupation codes. Uh, so the main result is here in this graph where you have the temperature beans on the horizontal axis and then the value for the beta coefficient. And you can see if you focus on the blue dots, which is the estimates for the entire labor market, that there is some evidence that higher temperatures are reducing uh, working hours. 
Uh, and then if you split the market between outdoor and indoor, you can see that all this effect is driven by outdoor jobs. Um, maybe it's more clearly here on the table. Uh, and something, to, something important to notice here is that even though there is some uh, negative effect of temperature on working hours, these coefficients are very small. So for instance, this minus 0 0.4 means that uh, they work uh, 40 minutes less in that week if instead of having the average temperature, they have a temperature within this uh, bin. And however, once I allow for intertemporal substitution, so they can substitute uh, working time between weeks, and I do that by including the temperature for the current week and the temperature for the previous week. And then once I take this cumulative effect, I find no effect of temperature on uh, working hours. And then I interpret this as evidence of intertemporal uh, labor substitution, and also as evidence that my uh, main result that I showed in the first graph is just capturing some temporary or non-persistent effect of temperature on working hours. So <laughs> I did some robustness checks uh, in the paper, there are more, but here I would present only these three. So I exclude the industries that uh, have had uh, labor demand that is more sensitive to changes weather, just to uh, kind of neutralize the uh, demand side of the labor market. I also control for residential sorting by considering only uh, those who uh, these days they live still in the same district they were born. Um, finally, I estimate a model with individual fixed effects and, and results uh, uh, do not change much. So to summarize, I find evidence that high temperatures reduce hours work, mainly driven by outdoor jobs. Uh, I find evidence of intertemporal labor substitution. And so to conclude, uh, given these differential effects between outdoors and, and indoor uh, workers, uh, there is some room for occupational safety and health policies like in developed countries, but uh, these policies are not in developing countries. Um, also, because there is an evidence of uh, intertemporal labor substitution, uh, there is room for mechanisms to encourage uh, more flexibility uh, to substitute uh, working time across weeks. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Minoru. We're going to move to uh, Vinicius Pekana. Okay, so uh, thanks for uh, for inviting me to present this conference. I'm really enjoying uh, the papers that, that I've, uh, I've seen. Uh, that's a joint work with uh, Ruji Rocha uh, from the Tudor Vargas Foundation in Sao Paulo and Dimitri Sherman from uh, Human High. Uh, that's an uh, ongoing uh, research. We are rerunning and rewriting parts of the paper. So uh, any feedback uh, it's, uh, is appreciated. So. Uh, in this paper, uh, we know uh, we are going to discuss the impact of heat or temperature shocks in health. Uh, and we know already uh, that there is a link between temperature and mortality, where most of these papers rely on cross-country or, or N, uh, trust county variation. Uh, and most of this research is done for uh, uh, developed countries. So there are a growing body of, uh, of literature on low uh, and middle-income countries, but that's still uh, uh, an ongoing uh, uh, and oh, let me, oh, moreover, um, there is some evidence that individuals adapt through uh, either defensive investments such as uh, air conditioning, or as Bianco was saying, and some other people here uh, as Minoru as well, uh, they can have uh, some changes in, uh, my, in labor supply or migrate. Uh, and the question that we make uh, in this paper is, uh, how low are the effects of temperature or mortality? So here we are looking at a city and we are asking if in a warm city already, so we are talking about Rio. So you have in mind the Rio, like the beaches and whatever. So it's a very warm country and arguably uh, citizens have uh, some adaptive behavior in warm summers or, or partially they can adapt for that. Uh, 
so you ask if this temperature uh, shocks uh, impact mortality in this setting. So if the shocks are localized, so you can observe a shock uh, that happens within a city, and we do observe this relationship between temperature and mortality, there is some role to design policies that can support household decisions through subsidies. So you can focus or target individuals who live uh, in these warm uh, areas in the city, uh, and we can increase the scope of available adaptation options uh, uh, to tackle this issue of uh, climate change. For example, we can deal with uh, urban planning. So that's the part of the paper that I won't talk today, uh, but we, we ask and we are uh, heading uh, into answering this question. So which policies can help mitigating the effects of extreme temperature on human life within a city? So it's a very local and localized policies. So to do that, uh, we use a novel uh, to economics approach. So uh, there's tons of research on remote sensing, but in economics, uh, uh, we, are, we are using this novel approach that we use uh, satellite data to capture exposure uh, on high temperatures within a city. So not the, the novel part is not using satellite data, but is using this one kilometer by one kilometer pixels that allow us uh, uh, to have around 15,000, uh, sorry, 1,500 uh, uh, pixels in a city. So it's kind of as, as if we had 1,500 uh, 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 ground station uh, uh, weather uh, our temperature variables in the city. So we can exploit this uh, high uh, frequency variation uh, in temperature and temperature shocks. Uh, and we combine this uh, exposure measure with uh, rich, health, uh, uh, rich uh, health data for the city of Rio. So Rio is a, a big city. So there are around 6.5, 7 million inhabitants and around 1.5, a little bit less than that uh, of individuals over six years uh, of age. So um, population is, is kind of, uh, at least is, is not uh, as old as you should expect, but we are focused on this one fifth year because that's uh, the main of the, the main of the results come from this, uh, this age. Uh, the, the neighborhoods are highly heterogeneous, so we can play some heterogeneity with that. I can discuss that uh, later on. And we're gonna focus on uh, deaths due to uh, circulatory diseases. So you can think about uh, uh, strokes or heart attacks, uh, Anything that relates to cardiovascular diseases is uh, within this cat category uh, in the population's age, uh, six years uh, and over. So there are two reasons for that. One is empirical. So these are uh, the age group that we do observe uh, an impact, as I'm going to show in the next uh, couple of slides. And besides it, the vulnerable age group. So we know already in like medical literature uh, that cardiovascular uh, is affected by high temperatures and that's where we are gonna do like most of the robustness checks on that. So that's the, as, as I mentioned before, that's the part of the paper that we are rerunning. Uh, so first we document that there is an impact on health, uh, temperature shocks impact health. And then we start how the rollout of uh, preventive healthcare and emergency care facilities can mitigate these impacts. So that's where uh, hopefully in a, in, a couple, uh, in a couple of like the next month or so, I'm gonna be able to present some of uh, these results. So briefly, the summary of the findings. So uh, we know we find the hot days in a typical uh, month in Rio account for almost 1.5% of circulatory deaths uh, in these individuals. Uh, this mean around, like, this mean uh, probably like 24, 25 additional deaths in a month. Uh, and more important than that, we, we find that there is enough uh, intra-city variation in exposure that allow us to estimate some of the fixed effects and estimate this, uh, this result. So temperature shocks are very localized in the city. So, and as, as I'm gonna show you one of the results, ignoring this, uh, we can un underestimate the impact of temperature on, on health. So we use the, the land surface temperature, uh, satellite modes is uh, uh, satellite, uh, aqua and Antera. And so we use data between uh, 2002 and 2016. Uh, so we have around 1500 pixels. Uh, we can use a, a huge cross-sectional variation on that and uh, uh, arguably overcome the genadium uh, ground stations placement. There, this might be an issue uh, in the literature. Uh, it's not perfectly correlated with air temperature, but it's a good proxy for maximal air temperature. So I'm going to come back to that uh, later when we interpret the results. And I think that's kind of like part of our contribution uh, is to deal with the imputation part. So we can we bring this remote sensing literature 
uh, to deal with this issue, to tackle with this issue. So we use this gap filling and plus ground truthing uh, to imputate um, uh, neighborhood specific relationship between land surface temperature and air temperature. So I'm happy to talk more about that uh, if you have uh, any questions, but uh, that's kind of like part of our contribution. And doing that, we can use this within city, uh, very rich and high frequency data within the city. So for the empirical strategy here, um, we are looking at the health outcome. So mortality for an individual that lives uh, uh, in neighborhood I, in year Y and month uh, M. We are controlling for neighborhood year fixed effects, uh, time fixed effect, uh, a rich set of controls that includes a health infrastructure, uh, weather controls and so on and so forth. And uh, that's our main variable here. That's the number of days that the land surface temperature is above uh, 40 degrees Celsius in that, that neighborhood. So 40 degrees Celsius in a land surface temperature uh, means around 34 uh, degrees Celsius uh, in the air temperature, uh, in a common air temperature measure that we see. And the important fix of fact here uh, to analyze the, the localizing fact is this neighborhood by month uh, fix effect. So what we are capturing here, we are capturing variations or interannual temperature deviations from neighborhood month historical averages. So if a neighborhood is very warm and very hot in, in say January or January in Brazil, so summer for us, um, people can adapt. So they can go less outside, they can work a uh, fewer hours, uh, they can turn on their air condition. So we are capturing unexpected shocks in this neighborhood by month. So anything that is, that is above the average in this neighborhood and this month. So anything that people uh, uh, cannot anticipate and is unexpected uh, from, for them. So very briefly, uh, and the result, so here's the table uh, for mortality for uh, all causes that you, you, we have in our data set and ages. So as you can see, the main, and the main variables uh, that we find here is for uh, total deaths for uh, age, uh, uh, old or, or individuals aged six year, uh, year, years or more, and it comes from circulatory diseases. So to have an idea of this impact, that's uh, uh, so one day above uh, uh, 40 degrees Celsius in a month uh, increases the mortality rate due to circulatory diseases by 0.42 uh, per 100,000 individuals. So that's kind of the average. So we, a typical month uh, in Rio has around four days above 40 degrees Celsius. So that's how we, we calculate that impact around like additional 24 deaths uh, to these causes. And the role of localized shocks uh, we can observe here playing with this fixed effect. So each fixed effect here has a, a, an interpretation by its own, but I'm going to focus on uh, the first two columns here. So the only difference between these two specifications is the including the uh, this fixed effect. The bi uh, bio here is neighborhood, so uh, neighborhood by month fixed effect. So if we don't control for that, and control for time fixed effect, for example, we are not capturing unexpected or unanticipated shocks in that neighborhood. So if you have a, a typical summer, we shouldn't expect this to impact uh, mortality because people can adapt. But if it's an unexpected, uh, an unexpected warm summer for a place that people already uh, know and, and, and behave like a warm summer, then uh, it's where our, our impact uh, come, kicks in. So we can play with different imputation strategies. So these results are, are, are robust to different imputations, uh, different uh, measures. So we can use heat wave, we can use degree uh, days. Uh, we don't observe harvesting uh, effects. Uh, we can play with like different thresholds instead of 40, we can play with 38, uh, 42 and, uh, and the thresholds. And there are some other robustness that we do in the paper. So let me conclude. Uh, we already knew that uh, high temperature uh, impact mortality, but we didn't know uh, how local this variation or the, the impact uh, uh, could be. Or... So that's where you're heading. And that's kind of like the main uh, topic for discussion that I have is like, we can think about localized policies that can mitigate, not deal with the root causes of climate change, or, or, but we can think about at least uh, in some policies uh, to mitigate these effects. 
And then the next steps for this paper, I need to, uh, I will characterize and analyze inequalities in the city. Rio is a very unequal city, so we can play with that and understand a bit more and possibly increase even more the scope uh, of policies to do with that. And yeah, that's it. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Vinicius. We're going to move uh, to uh, Philippe Cabor. Cabo. Yeah, Cabore. Cabore. Okay, thank you. Mm, can I? Okay, fine, it's working. Can you see my slide in the presentation mode? Yes. Okay, great. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm Philippe Cabore, and uh, this work is a joint work with my two supervisors, Nicola Rivers and Catherine de Riensong. I'm from University of Ottawa. So today, talk is about um, the economic impact of natural disaster. So when we think about natural disaster, I mean, there are many disasters related to climate change, and amongst them, there is a uh, wildfire. It happens every year, especially in developed countries. And um, some scenario from inst different institutions have shown that um, due to the increased level of uh, greenhouse gas, uh, we might expect uh, an increased frequency of wildfire, especially in developed countries. When you compare these, um, when you look at, at this graph, um, on the left side, we have uh, the frequency, the expected frequency of wildfire disaster in uh, development. Philip, sorry to interrupt you, but we, yeah. we cannot see the graph. We're still at the first uh, first page of your presentation. Oh, is it moving? No. Uh, no, we, we see the, the PDF version. I don't know if oh. that's what you're trying to show. Okay, that's, I don't know. Okay, maybe I will change the mode. Uh, is it working now? Yeah, now I see uh, motivation one and with a, a graph, disasters okay. caused by wildfires. Okay, I put it in full screen, that is maybe why. So in my graph, you can see that on the left hand side, uh, this is a predicted uh, frequency of wildfire disaster uh, in developed country. And the, the yellow one are for a, mid, a, a low increase of greenhouse gas in the future and medium, the orange one is the medium increase of greener gas and the red one is high scenario of a greener gas increase. And in, I mean, in each of them, you can see that uh, each of them is expecting to bring uh, an, a higher frequency of uh, wildfire disaster, wildfire event uh, in uh, developed countries. So this is the first motivation on why we should understand the economic impact of wildfire because it's expecting to increase and we don't have much or I would say non, no study on it for now. We do have some study on some disaster like a health quake or cut in Uruguayan, but not wildfire. And then the second motivation is I, Despite uh, the different wildfire we experiment uh, we experience in Canada, no study have tried to investigate uh, the economic impact. So to today we don't know exactly how much whether or not there is a cost associated to economic cost associated to the wildfire at the individual level. And uh, as I said, I mean this disaster including wildfire really tied to climate change and having a good idea of what is going on can help us better prepare uh, for can help us better prepare for these uh, disastrous events so quickly so far, Close to my study, uh, two study from you in US uh, focusing on Hurricane Katrina. The the study the impact of Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane Katrina on individual incomes, and they found that uh, for they found that strangely 
this event has increased um, the individual well-being. So I won't enter into the detail because of the time um, issue, but um, eventually they found that uh, the disaster create more opportunity for people to get, and then more opportunity, meaning that they were able to move to places with more economic, uh, better economic opportunities. They also experience an increase in uh, in wage because of uh, labor supply scarcity, and so all these combine increase uh, the earnings in the medium and long run. So um, the question we are trying to solve in this paper is, or to highlight in this paper is the economic impact of the short and long run impact of European. No, wife, slave lake wildfire on individual income. Just to put in perspective, Slave Lake is a small town in Alberta, Northern Alberta. And in 2011, Slave Lake has been affected by the second disaster, disaster, disaster um, wildfire, not wildfire, second disaster, uh, natural disaster in Canada. And all the residents of Slave Lake move out of Slave Lake for almost one month. And yeah, so they were pretty, they, everyone was affected by this uh, disaster. And yeah, as I said, this disaster cost almost uh, $1.2 billion. Uh, to, yeah, this is the cost, the estimated cost of this disaster at that time. And so my study will be one of the first to focus on slave leg, on the case of slave leg, but not only that, it's also among the raw paper to look at, at the economic impact of wildfire because we cannot assume that what is happening due to Uruguayan or earthquake will be similar to wildfire. So here, just to for you to visualize uh, the map, slave leg is really, I mean, it's almost the only regional center in that region. And you will see later, you will, I will show you some graph showing my control group and with respect to Slave Lake. And you will see how far Slave Lake are from other places. So we, rely, we mainly rely on um, longitudinal administrative data set. This is individual, this is a administrative data set. So it's uh, the T1, family file data set for those of you familiar to administrative data set and it's provided by the local RDCs and it has information on individual income and the component and it's longitudinal data going from 1982 to today but in our case since the the, disaster, the, the event happened in 2011 we look at at seven years before and after the disaster so this kind of study, the main challenge is to, to, to have a good control group. And let me show you this picture. So here is, uh, in red is the Slave Lake town. So what we did, we, we, we select our control group in three, different, in three ways. First, we First, we keep all the cities that, all the municipalities that look like Slave Lake, meaning that Slave Lake at the time of the disaster was, was a municipality of almost um, 7,000 population. So we keep all this municipality with between five to 10,000 population at that time. So these are, the blue dot are all the many similar municipality have Slave Lake in uh, Alberta. And then we draw some buffer uh, at uh, 100. The first buffer is all should capture all the similar municipality at 100 kilometers. And the second one at 200 kilometers, 300 kilometers, and then so on. And you can see that at 100 kilometers, there is no similar municipality as Slave Lake. And then at 200, between at 200 kilometers, we do have uh, similar means three similar municipalities and those will be our preferred control group and I will show you why. 
and later we will do, we will do a bunch of business check using the other similar municipality as well. So if you look at quickly at the summary statistic, we this is the characteristic the characteristic of the um, of our treatment group before the event. And this is the unmatched control group be, before the treatment as well. And you can see that on level, they are some time close to each other uh, regarding some income. But uh, when you do the T-test, the T-test between the unmatched and the treatment group is showing us that in much, much of the cases, they are not comparable. But uh, that is why we opt for a match control group uh, by applying uh, a matching technique. In this case, uh, the CEM. And you can see, see that uh, when we do that, we have uh, a control group. The match control group really look like uh, the treated group, which, uh, which uh, give us some, which make us confident that uh, we are uh, comparing apples to apples. So quickly to estimate, we, we use two different approach to estimate. Philippe, the I'm, I'm very sorry to interrupt you, but we're, uh, we're already past the, the, the time. Oh, so if, okay. you could, if you could wrap up in a minute, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So we use different and different estimation and uh, even study estimation to analyze uh, the, the, the Wi-Fi disaster impact. and we do find that um, the disaster is having, con uh, contrary to other people, we find that uh, this Wi-Fi is having a negative impact and we look at a different um, aspect like uh, employment status and we see that uh, employed people are the ones suffering the most uh, from this uh, disaster. And we also run a bunch of regression to see at which, where the, issue come from and we find that uh, mine, those working in the mining and agriculture sector are the most affected by this disaster. And we found that migration, it increased migration a little bit, but migration could not explain uh, the difference uh, in the incomes we are finding. And we found that uh, the effect of this disaster persists in the long and uh, medium uh, term in the medium and long term. And we ran a bunch of robustness check that, uh, a bunch of robustness check that showed that, uh, yeah, what we are finding is not spurious, meaning that uh, the disaster, this disaster has a negative impact of uh, on uh, individual incomes. And yeah, so in conclusion, I want to say that uh, the sector that were more that was exposed to the disaster are the most suffering. People working in the sector affected, directly affected by the wildfire are the most suffering from this disaster. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philip, for, uh, for uh, wrapping up. Uh, sorry for the, yeah, yeah, sorry. The, the hurry. And uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna finish this session with Annabella Bonada. Um, okay, I'm just going to share my screen. Okay, so you should be able to see that now. Um, okay, hi everyone. Yes, we can see. Um, so I'm in a group with economists, but I'm not an economist at all. So thank you for having me. Um, and I'm gonna take you away from humans a little bit and talk about uh, forests and trees. Um, so my name is Annabella Bonada. I'm a PhD student at the University of Guelph in Ontario. Um, I'll be presenting today a very small part of the third manuscript of my PhD dissertation, um, which I will be defending very soon, hopefully in the next couple of months. Um, and the title of my presentation today is Impact of Drought on the Growth Resilience of the Mixed Nocotagus Forest of Patagonia, Argentina. So I will give you a brief background on the research I conducted, the species I work with, and explain the approach I took to answer my research question. I will then show you and discuss one of my results. So as many of you 
already know, due to climate change, temperatures worldwide have risen by one degree Celsius since the 1950s. And it is projected to increase by another 1.5 degrees Celsius before we reach the middle of the current century. These changes have a direct effect on forest ecosystem, uh, ecosystems through increased disturbance events such as fire, pathogens, and drought, which can in turn lead to distribution changes, forest decline, and even tree mortality. So for the past several decades, scientists have become increasingly interested in researching how these extreme climate events affect tree growth across different regions and species. Um, the temperate forest of the Andes is culturally, ecologically, and economically significant, but also exceptionally fragile because of the mountain topography and sharp environmental gradient on which it, ex uh, it grows and exists. Um, there is also evidence that the climate of northern Patagonia, which is where my study is located, has been warming in recent decades and will continue to do so. Uh, there's also the expectation that extreme climate such as drought is going to increase in frequency and intensity. So the two species I study are Notophagus nervosa, which is known as Rowley Beach, and I'll call it beach from here on, um, and Notophagus obliqua, which is a pelling oak, and I'll call it oak, um, and they're both native to Chile and Argentina. And my study takes place in Argentina, where the two species coexist in the same forest, um, which is at the foothills of the Andes, and they're found in small fragmented uh, range of the temperate forest. So this is my actual study area. It's located in Lanin National Park in the province of Neuquén, Argentina. Um, it's within the natural, uh, sorry, the natural distribution of both species. And we selected seven sites based on this mixed distribution. So we cared about the forest where they're both together. Um, and that's found around Lacar Lake. And those are my seven sites on that map. So the research question for today is, um, how does drought affect the growth of these two species? So given that they grow together under the same site and climatic conditions, we wanted to know, do they respond similarly to drought events? And how is their radial growth affected when a drought event occurs? So the approach I use for this study is called dendrochronology. Dendrochronology is the science of assigning a calendar year to each tree ring through cross-dating. Cross-dating involves matching variations in tree ring width. Um, so in regions where we have seasons, uh, so just like in Canada we do, or here in this temperate forest, trees will grow a ring for each year. Um, and so the top left image is showing you how we take our samples, which is using an increment borer. And the bottom left image is after we sand them down, you can kind of see there the tree rings, and those are the ones we count and measure. Um, so if multiple trees from one span have a similar tree ring pattern, we can attribute these differences um, to changes in climate. So in general, a wide ring could indicate favorable climate, such as a rainy year, and a narrow ring could indicate less favorable growth conditions, such as a drought year. So for my study, I used a set of four drought indices to determine just how resilient trees are to a drought event. So think of resilience as a capacity to bounce back. Um, I use these indices to calculate how the radial growth is affected during the drought event, how well trees continue to grow after the drought event, and how well they recover to growth rates before the drought event. So the four indices, um, drought indices, and their calculations are shown here. Uh, but today, due to time, I'm only going to focus on recovery and relative resilience. Uh, recovery refers to how well a tree resumes growth after a drought event by taking the ratio of growth post-drought and growth during the drought event. And relative resilience refers to how well a tree recovers the growth rates observed before the drought event and takes into consideration the damage that was incurred during that drought. So first of all, we had to determine the actual drought events and we determined 15 um, that we could compare with our tree ring data. So there's information on this slide, but I wanted you to be able to see for yourself how tree rings are affected during a year of drought. So the very top uh, graph here shows you the self-calibrated Palmer Drought Severity Index. This is a standardized index that considers precipitation and temperature to estimate relative uh, dryness. It's very effective at quantifying long-term drought, and especially for my study region. 
the middle and the bottom uh, graphs are showing you the average tree ring width for each site. Uh, so this one is for beach and this one's for oak. So each one of those lines represents one of my sites. Um, and each one of those lines could represent anywhere between 20 and 30 trees. So after I measure them, I create a chronology. This is a raw chronology, so I haven't done anything to it. So the idea here is just to show you, okay, these are the drought events I'm gonna use for my, uh, for my research. But I wanted to point out um, the three dashed ones clearly had an effect on tree growth at all sites. It, you can see that there's a, a big reduction in tree growth. But uh, this drought event, which is um, 1989, uh, the solid line, doesn't have the same effect for every tree or every site. So that's why we picked so many drought events to look at, um, because it's not necessarily going to have the same result. So the first result I'm going to show you is the recovery index, which again is a measure of the ability of a tree to recover from a disturbance. So I'd like to draw your attention to the three years for which I found um, a significant relationship between the two uh, species for those years. So the oak is in blue and the beech is in that purplish pink color. Um, so what we see here is a variable response, but out of these three, um, oak did recover better. However, beech recovered better for 2008. So that it's already, you know, uh, causing some ideas, uh, questions, like what is happening here? Why is there a difference? Um, so next, when we look at relative uh, resilience, which again is the ability to achieve pre-drought performance, for those same years, oak does better than beech. And even for 2008, when uh, beech had recovered better, oak is still very little, but doing a little bit better than beech. Um, so what this means, oh, sorry. And the other thing I'd like to point out is um, this dashed line means uh, that would mean a full relative resilience. So it's it means that the trees were able to fully get back to that growth level that they had before drought. But as you'll notice, except for uh, beach in 1962, all of the other years, the trees did not reach full resilience. So this means that after a drought event, these negative effects are persisting for years. So what are some possible explanations and implications of these results? Um, generally, it is known that this oak species is more drought tolerant than beech. So I expected that it would recover better for the drought events, but why was 2008 different? Well, 2008 was preceded by a fairly long time of wet years. So this is the beech species because it, it's better at taking up water than oak. However, Oak is much better at regaining the level of growth it had before the drought event, that relative resilience. Um, and this could be due because it is better adapted to drought conditions. And so it reserves, uh, it has some reserves for when an extreme drought event occurs. But more importantly from these results is that neither species reached that full level of growth that it had before the drought event occurred. So that means that the drought long last, the long lasting effects of drought on growth um, are there for both species. So this all means that given the projections for increased drought events, the recovery of trees of both these species to future drought will be highly compromised. This could lead to forest decline and even tree death. Um, understanding how these effects, uh, how these events affect tree growth is important for forest management and global carbon budgeting. Forest ecologists suggest that mitigating the effect of climate change is very difficult on, on trees. It's becoming increasingly more difficult. And so they're calling on managers to focus on the resilience of forests, which is what we just looked at now, in order to maintain some of the ecosystem services that they provide. So it is imp imperative that information on drought resilience of these species be considered when creating adaptive management plans in the face of a changing climate. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Annabella, for uh, this great presentation. Um, so we're now at the questions and answers. So if anyone has a question, I, I know there is actually one in the chat from uh, Philip. So Philip, if you would like to ask your question uh, directly, that would be great. All right. Well, I'm a uh, 
I guess I'm just going to read it. So the question is for Minoru. Uh, Philip is asking, uh, how do you account for adaptation? Papers I read use income with the idea that higher income earners are likely to adapt than other groups. Uh, okay, uh, thank you, Philip, for your question. Um, here, adaptation is uh, adaptation uh, across weeks. So how you change your time across weeks. Yep. All right, I think <clears throat> Ola has a question. I do indeed have questions. I have questions pretty much to everyone because the topic is so exciting. And I learned so much uh, uh, from all, you, all of your presentations. So um, I'll go just one by one because maybe those questions will intersect. So um, to me, Nuru, um, how the last, so if we talk about the working, the, the impact of uh, heat on, uh, on working hours. So you say that uh, people tend to, uh, that your, your data shows, the result of your of analysis of your data shows that people tend to work less when it's much hotter, especially when, especially when we talk about the outdoor uh, activities. So do you consider per hour work like it is uh, in Canada? So when, when people are paid per hour, is that something that you have studied? Because then it would tend to decrease the, the household income in general. Um, so have you considered that? Like, because maybe I didn't understand it really well, or maybe uh, you, I, I missed the, the, the point when you mentioned that, but that would be nice if you, if you could address that. Um, the other question is to uh, Vinicus, which uh, sim similar. Uh, in the end, you, you said that um, uh, Rio is highly um, inequal is, is a city with the high inequality, and you're going to study um, the impact of uh, heat waves on, uh, on the mortality uh, based also on the income household. Uh, the household income. So have you have some, do you have some preliminary results already can, that you can share with us to tell how does it affect the especially low income households that do not have, that, that we know that don't have this uh, luxury of air conditioner at home, right? Uh, so how do they, and in general, how the government and how it's in, it's encountered in the data that uh, certain um, um, mortality is due to heat waves and not to other causes. Um, thank you. Uh, um, sorry, I, I... So you you mean if I have information about uh, this uh, hour? No, sorry. I, I, the uh, sorry, yeah. So, so the impact of uh, on in of household income. Oh, uh, okay. Have you studied that? Because, for example, in Canada we are paid per hour. Uh, how about the Peru? Is that the case there? Uh, I think there is a lot of variety. Some of them yes, some of them no. Uh, but no, I, I haven't checked the this income outcome uh, yet. No. And uh, thanks for the question. I think uh, there is a, uh, some work that I, I need to do to uh, exploit some heterogeneity. Uh, in terms of like inequality can be social uh, economic conditions and uh, 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 within uh, neighborhoods. So one thing that we do, uh, at least for like uh, in a more econometric sense, uh, we are controlling for this uh, neighborhood fixed effects or we kind of capture uh, partially uh, uh, if, the, if the neighborhood's richer and assuming that uh, they can cluster. Uh, so rich people live in richer areas, and so it's kind of, uh, we are partially, that's not a, 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 a total answer, um, but we can play with, so we have, uh, we can use the census data and the census tract and use the pixels, uh, so we can calculate uh, some measure of, uh, of where poor people live in each neighborhood, and then we can use the pixels to uh, 
uh, to create a measure of shock, like a more local shock. So we can look at each neighborhood and then in each neighborhood, we can exploit the variation uh, of shocks among uh, uh, these places and reach and, and, and pre areas. So that's where, where we are heading. And we have, we, we've done uh, uh, some, some things. Uh, so they're not as robust where we, I need to do uh, more robustness checks uh, to be more confident in the answers. But it seems that uh, individuals, uh, places with like low, uh, 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 less educated people within the same neighborhood uh, uh, have a higher burden uh, of these shocks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think Philip has a comment or a question. So Philip, go ahead. Yes, thank you. I have a question for Minoru. So there have been a paper in, by Shin in Canada to assess uh, how extreme temperature might affect uh, uh, and the working hours as well as wages uh, of workers. And they have shown that um, there is something they call shirking, meaning that um, people working, people working in places where they have union tend to take the days they are allowed to, meaning that when it's odd, they will take some, they will take some day off because they are allowed to either to enjoy or stay at home, but and that is what they call shirking, meaning that it doesn't have really an effect on their work in the sense that uh, they're allowed to do those day off, but at the end, they will be paying exactly the amount they should receive in a, for a week, within a week. And is it something you also consider in your analysis? Whether or not people can shirk depending on whether or not um, they're unionized or not. Uh, thank you, Philip. Yes, uh, like I mentioned, this is one of the limitations. So I won't be able to talk about like shirking behavior or also if you uh, have to meet deadlines, you cannot capture that. Uh, can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, so, okay, uh, for being issues, uh, so it's uh, very interesting this, uh, to exploit this local variation within uh, a city. Uh, so my question there is, uh, so, so, so shall we, we worry about like uh, uh, that variation is not enough within a city because it's such a small uh, a spatial uh, <laughs> is a dimension that, that we're exploring? Yeah, so first, first uh, yeah, that, that was like my concern uh, in the beginning of, uh, of this research, if we had enough variation uh, within a city. So Rio is not that small in the sense that I probably, uh, if you think uh, in a, like 6.5 or 7 million uh, uh, cities and uh, cities, so it's, it's a big city. Uh, but maybe we can have some, uh, some uh, external validity issues to study other cities. But in the city, like I, I haven't showed the context uh, graph or some descriptive uh, stats, but there is enough variation. So each neighborhood is very different from the others. Uh, although at some point you can have a heat wave uh, across the city. So it's kind of like we have this time series shock and then we also exploit the cross-sectional shock. And both of them will have cross-sectional dif uh, difference and both of them will have uh, enough variation uh, to, to uh, exploit. But that, that was... Uh, that was a concern. Then we play with like several fixed effects in the in the paper as well to understand a bit more like exactly what is the variation that we are uh, exploiting um, in this in each specification. Thank you. Um, I have a question uh, for Annabella. Um, I uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I saw in your graph where you show uh, the drop patterns and uh, relative recovery or uh, recovery or relative resilience. I can't remember which one patterns, uh, the ones that match with the three uh, lines. Uh, I think I saw two drought, droughts with a similar amplitude as the ones that had an effect, but these two droughts didn't have any effect on, uh, on growth. And I was wondering if you had any insights on that. Um. 
So you're you're looking at like other ones. Uh, yeah. So yeah. Um. So for the rest of the manuscript, it, there's a lot on. I don't know if you notice all the little dots. There are periods where there were lots of little like orange and yellow dots, and then periods where, where there weren't. So when there were was one drought after another, it affected growth in a different way. Um, so maybe sometimes even though like you're seeing a similar drop, but you didn't see that in growth, um, those trees have been suffering drought for a while. So they wouldn't necessarily grow much less for that one year. Uh, so it could be due to that. I, is that what, what the question that you're asking or you were asking about the other drop? Uh, no, I think that's what I was asking. So okay. yeah, yeah. That, that, I guess that explains uh, my, that's an, a good answer. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so I think Ola had a raised hand, but it's not raised anymore. So I don't know if you still uh, have something to say. I actually had a question to Annabella, so also about, right. but more generic. Mm -hmm. uh, but would you uh, suggest uh, uh, as a policy to preserve trees? Because we are heading to a much hotter world, right? And your results suggest that trees do not really adapt well to hot weather. So what? Would do you expect to see as a policy? Because what we are told is basically that trees will save us, right? But it's not exactly what we see now from your uh, results. So what would you suggest um, to, as a policy to do in this uh, in this case? Thank you. That is like an excellent question and really good because um, these results were very surprising to us. So it's something I've been thinking about and I wouldn't have a very good answer for you right now. Um, because uh, what manager, what forest managers talk about is, okay, do we plant other species of trees then? So as you saw, my two species aren't doing so well. So then do we focus and shift? Uh, they, they coexist in this forest with other species. So then do we kind of um, encourage the other ones to grow if they're doing better? But then we wouldn't have these natural species anymore. So because we can't stop what's happening. We can't stop the drought events from occurring. Um, no, I've been thinking about that so much, so I don't, I don't have a really good answer. But, uh, but the expectation is that they're not going to disappear yet. They're just going to possibly shift their distribution to um, like the west side of where my uh, my study area is um, over many years. Like they will start to shift to where it's a little bit wetter to that end. Um, so it gives us time to think about it. But yeah, it's so hard to know what to do. Um, but thank you so much. That's an excellent, excellent question. All right, uh, we're running out of time uh, already, but uh, we're gonna finish with uh, Minoru who has raised, raised his hand. Thank you. I have a question for Philippe. So uh, I, just, I was wondering uh, how important is uh, in this uh, research about wildfires to consider uh, the wind direction? And is, is that something that you are considering too? Yeah, thank you, Minoru. Uh, right now, we are not considering the wind direction because we know exactly what was the area burned by this um, wildfire. So we know who was affected, who weren't affected. So that is why we feel like uh, uh, the wind doesn't really matter. The wind will matter if, for example, we weren't sure about uh, who can who is the, in the treatment and control group but in this case it's clear who is in the treatment and control group and yeah that's why for now we haven't considered the ring um, if i can quickly add something to that question because i actually did my masters on wildfire modeling um, wind is very important and if i remember correctly uh, the square of wind is the coefficient that you have in a in a mechanistic model of wildfire. Wind is important. Uh, the the square of wind is is very important. So yeah. All right. So this uh, ends our second session. We uh, have twenty minutes for lunch for the people for which uh, this is lunch break because we're not all in the same uh, time zone. So thank you everyone uh, for. Uh, participating and uh, we will see you at three for the third uh, session. And I invite everyone to wonder in case you want to move the, the discussion to informal way. Thank you.
Okay, and uh, Etienne, I think you meant to see you at two, not three. Uh, we do have another session in 15 minutes, right? Oh, you're, you're right. Yes, it okay. is at uh, two, not three. <laughs> Thank you. Thank okay, you. no worries. All right, so on that note, uh, the folks project, uh, presenting in Digesting Climate Change, if you're already here, Veronica, Olivia, and Richard, we will invite you to hang around with us here as folks go off to wonder and test your uh, slide sharing. So you're more than welcome to, to turn on your camera whenever you're ready, and then we could go ahead and set you up. Hello, Anna. Hi, Veronica. Hi, Anna. How are you? I'm good. Nice to see you. <laughs> nice so to see would, you too. would you like to go ahead and um, just make oh, sure yes. you're... Yes, 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 sure. Thank you. Let's see. Do you see it? Yeah. Do you want to yeah, just perfect. full screen it and make sure? Just sometimes oh, okay. it goes to presenter view, so we just want to... Inch. Okay, that looks great. Wonderful. Okay. Yeah, perfect. perfect. Thank, you. Thank you. And you have no video or any sound in your presentation? Just oh, no, oh. just um, slides, it's okay. Okay, wonderful. Where are you uh, zooming in from today? I am in Ecuador now. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Here is like one hour less than there, so I was checking the time. Uh -huh. I said, okay, for me, it's just 1 p.m., so when I received an email to say, please, can you present at 2 p.m.? I was like, okay, it's less one, one. <laughs> uh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and have you, yeah. have you stayed there for a long time, I guess? You went, um, have you been there for a few months because of the pandemic, et cetera, or? Yeah, yeah. you're right. I, I was in, in Canada, in Thunder Bay, at Lakehead University, but, um, you know, pandemic times. Yep. change everything so i should exactly. keep back here <laughs> okay wonderful well yeah good it's nice to meet you i look forward to your presentation so you Thank can you, so you still have 15 minutes so go oh, yeah. grab, grab something to drink or whatever you need and uh, just relax and we'll get your oh, yeah. <laughs> colleagues set up thanks veronica thank you and see you see you okay. soon see you soon all right folks so olivia and richard let me just looking for you in the list but i don't think you're here here comes olivia now <clears throat> and no richard yet no problem hi olivia if you once you can hear me feel free to turn on your video and we can uh, test your screen share before your presentation hi hi um sure Screen share. Is it showing up? It's getting there. Uh, yeah. Do you want to just full screen it just so we can yeah. make sure it doesn't go to presenter mode? Okay. Looks beautiful. Oh, that looks beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> right. Not only making me hungry, but it's nice to see so many colors on the on your screen. <laughs> and you're you're here, are you? You're in Montreal right now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just the uh, folks are all over the place uh, zooming in here today. So I'm oh. asking um, one of your co-panelists is actually in Ecuador right now. Wow. And then uh, we have Richard, who's um, at the University of Ottawa, but we'll see where he is when he arrives here. Awesome. Anyhow. All right. Well, you're good to go, Olivia. So if you Thanks. can, you can go back behind the scenes and we'll invite you in <laughs> when we get started again. Thank you. Okay.
Hi, Etienne. Just to let you know, we're still uh, missing Richard over here. So we have Olivia and Veronica that are, who are good to go. All right. But we don't have our third, unless he's here. Richard might be here under a different name. I don't know, but uh, yeah, yeah. Y a pas de Richard <laughs> otherwise. So. Okay. Well, uh, Alex is moderating uh, this time. Okay. So I'll let him uh, handle that. Yeah, I'll uh, let's send him an email to in case. Yeah, we we can just start with uh, the two others and maybe yeah. he'll join later. Yeah, it's and do you think well, uh, Imadari, can you send him an email? Yeah, I can do that. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, let's What's get happening. I'm sorry. Um, so our third presenter, um, Richard. Richard is is not present. Yes, he's not present because he has teaching. He he knows that he's presenting at two twenty. Okay. So perfect. he should be there by that time. Yes. Oh, Unfortunately, okay. he's busy. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. No problem. All right, so let's get started on this session titled Digesting Climate Change. Our first presenter, um, oh wait, I have the old one here, so new one. Our first presenter is Veronica Paredes from the Faculty of Natural Resources Management at Lakehead University. And the title is Asserting Indigenous Food Sovereignty Through Art. Go ahead, Veronica. Thank you so much. I'm going to try to share my screen. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Uh, thank you so much for being here. My name is Veronica Paredes. I am a student at Lakehead University. Today, I will talk about the asserting food, indigenous food sovereignty through art. This ongoing research has been supported by Queen Elizabeth Scholars and Fletch Project. For this study, I have collected indigenous art from Canada and Ecuador, have conversations with artists and gather information about this, the aspects that are included in indigenous food serenity. This interdisciplinary and transnational research includes indigenous worldviews from the North and South, inviting us to think about how the global and local change when we do not assume that speaking about indigenous peoples refers to a specific nation, but they are constituted across space, sharing similar worldviews, traditions, and visual expressions to assert their identity and to keep their relevance in the modern world. This research aims to contribute to indigenous food serenity knowledge grounded in visual culture as part of critical theory that reveal and challenge power structures. When we talk about food studies, we talk about projects that require an interdisciplinary vision. For this research, I have included visions from humanities through art, social sciences through conversational methodology and from psychology where food is considered as a source of social identity. Artists support this study from indigenous communities in Canada like Shelby Gagnon, Sean Herican, Christy Belcourt and indigenous artists from the Central Highland communities in Ecuador, Alfredo Toaquiza, Jose Masaquiza, and Rodrigo Perez, whose art is present today. Some authors have recognized that decolonization, self-determination, and the land dispossession are central themes in food sovereignty. Those topics seem to be more under an indigenous framework, and it has to be seen as a way of resistance. Scholars have demonstrated how indigenized indigenizing food sovereignty is different from the state-centric and agriculture-focused frame. One of, the, one of the main problems within food systems is the land dispossession. The neoliberal food regime has displaced communities causing problems such as hunger, unhealthy ecosystems, health affectations, and loss of biodiversity. Regulating, um, rele relegating indigenous ways of knowing and being. When we talk about indigenous peoples, we can observe some similarities. For example, health problems are affect mostly to indigenous communities. 15% of the world extreme poor are indigenous. The colonization and the neoliberal food regime has, have displaced indigenous communities, causing problems such as hunger, 
unhealthy ecosystems, health affectations, loss of biodiversity, and this could pose a serious threat to our food, life, livelihoods, health, and environment. Indigenous peoples prioritize the reconnection to land, indigenous food, and traditional knowledge. Indigenous peoples right to food is inseparable from the right, their rights to land, territories, resource, culture, and self-determination. To embody of connection, the embody of connection between nature and humans were damaged because of the displacement of indigenous people from their communities. In Canada, indigenous peoples were separated from their territories from, for military reasons and resource extraction. Similarly, in Ecuador, there are still land dispossession due to foreign companies that threaten to destroy the ecosystem, forcing the inhabitants, especially of the Amazon, to abandon their territories. It is a constant fight against environmental pollution, deforestation, and loss of, of habitat. The quest for land and survival in, in Canada make the indigenous people sign treaties. In this, in this, and this push them onto reserves as seen in the communities today. Atura Wampam used to create living treaties between indigenous people and nations like Britain, Canada, and the United States. The belt consists of two rows of purple wampum beads on a white background. The treaty ceremony would involve each faction giving the other a two row wampum with the two hor horizontal rows of shells representing the mutual relationship and the straight path the two nations would go together. I should mention that beads are playing an integral role in, in repairing cultural ties and spiritual beliefs to indigenous artists. Bead work has been and will continue to be significant in representing indigenous resilience, as well as highlighting the distinct cultural, cultural value of indigenous peoples. For some women indigenous artists, beads, beads have come to represent indigenous resilience after the effects of colonialism and the residential school system. Loss of identity results from the displacement of people from their land, and this can erode a sense of self and further, the, and further disconnect people from the past or their traditional practices. Like healing and preservation of knowledge through the beating in Canada, in Ecuador, few indigenous artists like Rodrigo Perez in Cacha community and Jose Masakisa in Salazaca still preserve the making of an ancestral tapestry to, com to communicate their worldviews and to preserve their ancestral knowledge. Using natural raw materials such as sheep wool, plant derived dyes as such as cochinilla, a process in which women, children, and men for, from the community participate, um, strengthening the sense of living in community and harmony with the environment. To explain the importance that land has, indigenous peoples around the world claim the earth is our mother, our life, and our freedom. Indigenous knowledge, languages, cultural practices, and other traditions built up over, over the millennia are all connected to the land. We, indigenous peoples, and our lands are the same. To destroy one is to destroy the other, said the Iquitos Declaration. All life is sacred and all related um, what we do affects the whole universe. So let us work in balance with Mother Earth and all her peoples, said Smiling Bee. Here we can observe uh, one painting from the um, Ecuadorian artists and we have the same mountain here. <laughs> The Pachamama is a divinity of the ancestral indigenous cultures. She represents uh, our planet, the land we inhabit. For indigenous peoples, the Pachamama is a subject, someone with whom societies exchange and dialogue. And in that dialogue, they establish rituals of celebration. The close relationship with, that the native inhabitants maintained with the environment and with the Pachamama was the basis from which the life forms of families and communities. To understand the complexity, the complexity of indigenous worldviews, one needs to understand why access to lands and therefore food 
is a question of survival. Usually unwritten and preserved in oral tradition, indigenous knowledge involves spirituality, values, normative rules, and cultural practices that have been represented in paintings, textiles, and ceremonies that inanimate the transmission of indigenous knowledge from generation to generation with the purpose to maintain their identity, place, and cosmology. Mother Earth is considered as a goodness. Therefore, everything that is here is also sacred. Throughout human history, particularly in indigenous cultures, food has, has been perceived as sacred. The word sacred is not a religious term, but rather one that simply means set apart or not of the ordinary. It is also related to sacrifice, which may mean that something is sacred because it derived from something sacrificed. In ancient, in ancient times, some temples, mountains or forests were sacred because animals were sacrificed to a good in those temples. All food is sacred in the sense that the life of a, of a plant or animal has been sacrificed to feed another being. In Ecuador, indigenous communities celebrate festivals and rituals to honor Mother Earth and thank her for the crops to eat, the plants to prepare medicines, the trees to build houses and tools. For Anishinaabe nations, practices of hunting, fishing and gathering blossom through the belief that everything that grows and lives should be treated with honor and, and respect. It is essential for indigenous people to take from the earth only what we need and be grateful for what Mother Earth gives us. Some concepts such, such as sustainability have been present in indigenous philosophy. If we can combine some of this vision with science, perhaps we could recover the soils that in some cases are affected by overexploitation by large, by large food companies. The bond they have created with nature is based on respect for it, for biodiversity and the holistic understanding of human beings as part of everything. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Veronica. That was great perspective to for interdisciplinarity that we need, we need to take into account indigenous perspectives in art and i think it's a really important conversation thank you so let's move on to olivia eau claire with uh, from the faculty of agricultural and environmental sciences at mcgill university the title of uh, her presentation is carbon footprint of canadian self-selected diets comparing intake of food groups nutrients and a diet quality among low and high greenhouse gas emission diets. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'll just get right into it. So just to give a bit of background, the global food system accounts for about a quarter of greenhouse gas emissions globally. So I'll refer to this as GHGE. Um, and I'm sure everyone here is familiar with the Paris Agreement, which aims to limit global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. But to do this, we will have to substantially decrease um, greenhouse gas emissions. So currently, trends in greenhouse gas emissions from the food system are on a trajectory that could actually preclude achievement of the Paris Agreement targets, even if all non-food non and fossil fuel emissions were halted. So um, this figure was taken from a recent simulation study that showed how different intervention strategies could reduce emissions from the food system. So the green bars, which I outlined here in red, are interventions that are directly related to consumer dietary patterns and behaviors. So, um, you know, if we were to, a reduction in emissions that could occur if we were to shift over to plant-rich diets or if we were to reduce our calories to a healthy level, since in Western uh, culture, we tend to overconsume food and calories. Um, and what they found is that it would require a combination of these intervention strategies to actually achieve the Paris Agreement targets. So what's really important to take from this slide is that consumers have a very important role in meeting global scientific targets for climate change. Um, so all food starts on the farm, undergoes some form of packaging and processing, distribution to retail and grocery before uh, we're finally able to eat that food. And some major sources of greenhouse gas emissions are things like land clearing, fertilizer uh, production and use, enteric fermentation from beef and dairy cattle, etc. Um, most of these impacts occur on the farm. 
But it's also important to note that there are many other uh, impacts beyond just greenhouse gas emissions, things like land and water use, acidification, eutrophication, as well as loss of biodiversity. So um, this figure was taken from a recent meta-analysis that curated a database of environmental impacts for uh, different animal and plant-based foods. And what they found is that in general, the environmental impacts of animal-based foods largely exceed that of plants, but they also found a lot of variability among similar products. So for every 100 grams of protein, for example, the carbon footprint of beef is almost nine times that of poultry. But animal and plant-based foods also differ in how they contribute to our overall nutrition and health, and they also have different economic and sociocultural implications, which brings me to the concept of sustainable diets, which really encompasses this link between human and planetary health. So um, back in 2019, Health Canada published the first revamp of Canada's food guide in over a decade. And the new guide is depicted by this plate, which largely, um, which emphasizes plant-based uh, foods. Uh, so a lot of fruits and vegetables, whole grains and protein foods. So typically we hear protein and we think of beef or chicken, eggs, et cetera, but they're really placing the emphasis on plant-based protein sources. Now, although the food guide wasn't informed explicitly by environmental sustainability, um, should Canadians choose to follow dietary guidance, this will have implications beyond just our, you know, our nutrition and our health. And this is something that a lot of other countries have already started uh, to do. So this brings me to the objectives of my research, which first was to estimate the carbon footprint of self-selected diets in Canada. And the second was to compare intake of foods, nutrients, and diet quality among um, low and high greenhouse gas emission diets. So as a foundation of this research, I use data from the Canadian Community Health Survey Nutrition which was, um, it's a cross-sectional survey uh, that was conducted in 2015, um, nationally representative. It used 24 hour recalls to collect information on the foods and beverages consumed by Canadians um, and nutrient intakes for the foods reported in the CCHS were taken from the Canadian nutrient file, which is Canada's reference food composition database. Now, greenhouse gas emission estimates of 332 commodity foods were taken from data fields. So this is a curated database of environmental impacts, well, mainly greenhouse gas emissions uh, taken from life cycle assessment studies. Uh, so life cycle assessments quantify the environmental impacts of a food product throughout its lifespan. But the boundaries for most of the life cycle assessments included in this database were cradle to farm gate in some cases cradle to processing gate. And we also accounted for food loss in our calculation of greenhouse gas emissions. And these estimates we got from St Statistics Canada. So this is a schematic illustrating how I managed to link greenhouse gas emissions and food loss estimates for commodities to uh, foods reported in the 24 hour recalls. So you can think of a commodity as a food that can't be broken down further. So like an avocado, for example, we used a recipe database from the USDA, um, which contained basically foods broken down into their commodities or their ingredients. So I could then say aggregate the emissions of an avocado, a lemon, and an onion to then get an estimate for guacamole, for example. And we then used a separate database to link the US food codes to uh, Canadian food codes. But we were also interested in looking at different nutrient outcomes. So we first looked at nutrient intakes, or more specifically, intakes of nutrients of public health concern, which in Canada are calcium, vitamin D, iron, and potassium. So these are nutrients that typically Canadians are not getting enough of. And we also looked at nutrients to limit. So those that we typically consume in excess, like saturated fat and sodium. And we also looked at overall diet quality using a metric called the Alternative Healthy Eating Index. So this is an index made up of 11 different uh, components, uh, foods and nutrients that are consistently associated with markers of disease risk. Higher scores were indicative of higher overall diet quality. 
Uh, we divided our sample into quintiles based on their diet related greenhouse gas emissions, which uh, we expressed as kilograms of CO2 equivalents per 1000 calories to correct for total energy intake. Respondents in the first quintile we refer to as low greenhouse gas diets and those in the fifth quintile as high greenhouse gas diets. Um, we also used, used age and sex standardized means uh, and t-tests to detect differences among the different diet groups. We also used survey and bootstrap weights to obtain nationally representative estimates. So what we found is that about uh, three quarters of Canadians diet related carbon footprint derived from animal based foods and about half of that alone came from red and processed meat. And to look at that in a little more detail, um, beef was by far the largest contributor to our diet related greenhouse gas emissions, followed by luncheon and other meats, poultry, milk and cheese. Now this graph is showing uh, intake of different food groups among the low and high GHGE diet groups. Um, so we found that high GHGE diet respondents had oops, higher intakes of most animal based foods so red and processed meat, dairy, fish and shellfish, but also higher intakes of miscellaneous foods and beverages and vegetables and fruit and lower intakes of cereals, grains and breads. We also found that high greenhouse gas diet respondents had higher nutrient intakes, so higher intakes of nutrients of concern, but also higher intakes of nutrients to limit with the exception of sugars. But we also found that the low greenhouse gas diet group had a higher overall diet quality. So this graph is showing the 11 different components that I was talking about making up this, this, um, this score. Each component is scored from uh, zero to 10. And you can see that the biggest discrepancy was for this red and processed meat component. So to summarize those findings, uh, again, we found animal-based foods and particularly red and processed meat and beef contributed most to our diet-related greenhouse gas emissions. And high greenhouse gas diet respondents had higher intakes of nutrients, but, the, but a lower overall diet quality. So what this shows is that there are synergies and there are trade-offs among the different dimensions of diet sustainability and environmental sustainability and nutrient outcomes and health are not always compatible with one another. So this is an important consideration uh, moving forward uh, with future research. So um, quickly, some of the strengths of this research were use of a nationally representative survey and a peer reviewed database of greenhouse gas emissions, um, which we then linked to foods in the CCHS. But there were some limitations. So data field estimates were global and thus not specific to Canada or the North, North American production practices. There's also a high heterogeneity among greenhouse gas emission estimates. Um, and also we only looked at one indicator of environmental impact being greenhouse gas emissions, whereas there are many others. So hopefully this research will extend our knowledge of sustainable diets to the Canadian context. Um, hopefully inform future dietary guidance as it has in uh, many other countries and also increase public awareness as to this link between human and planetary health. So thank you very much for, for listening. Thank you, Olivia. That was excellent. Very clear, very interesting. Uh, so just to keep in mind, we'll, we have a Q&A session at the end. If you have any questions, you could put them in the chat now and we'll read them out later or you could wait until 2.30. So our next presenter, Richard, uh, Hishal, are, are you here? Hmm. Anna, do you see Richard in the... I don't see Richard. He's not here. We may uh, go with the Q&A now. And let's see uh, if when he will come because he's teaching. I know that that's why we moved him to uh, to be the last presenter of the session because he asked for it. He's teaching until two thirty, and he agreed to present it to twenty. So let's hope that by two thirty he will make it. Okay. <laughs> Sorry so, about that. Thank you. So then, um, let's go ahead with a question from Sandra. You do. You, want to ask it in person well if you want to ask it in person just uh put on your microphone if not i can ask it 
Sure, I can ask it. Hi, thank you very much for a really interesting two sets of presentations. Mm -hmm. So yeah, my question was, what's the main takeaway from Olivia's research? And if we use that greenhouse gas emission metric for environmental impact, how does a, the most ideal diet look like in terms of how much of each thing we want to eat? Um, thanks for your question. It, it's a really good question. And this is a field that is relatively new, like looking at the environmental impacts of overeating and different diets. Um, I would say the main takeaway is um, typically diet, self-selected diets. So diets based on what, what people are actually eating with more plant-based foods typically have a lower environmental impact. And this is a finding that's shown pretty consistently across studies. Most of these studies have been conducted in Europe. Um, however, it's also important to consider some of these nutrient outcomes that could arise. So I'll, I, I think some people will argue a vegetarian or a vegan diet might, um, you know, might lead to uh, deficiencies in certain nutrients. So it's important to weigh these different dimensions. And to be honest, it's it's hard to give an exact diet. It's, it's hard to say, yeah, everybody should be eating this. Um, and I don't know if anyone here has heard of the Eat Lancet report, but they came out with sort of this universal, healthy and sustainable diet. Um, but this is sort of hard because like dietary patterns differ from country to country, person to person. There's a lot of uh, this cultural acceptability that you have to also take into account. So I know that's not a direct answer to your question, but I think that's something that research is trying to figure out because it's really important to weigh these different dimensions with each other and not just consider any one dimension um, in isolation. Okay, thank you. Um, did you want to ask your follow-up question too? If it's yes, thanks a lot, Olivia. That that totally makes sense. Um, so my follow-up question was when you uh, presented the the food system from farm to our plates, basically, it was uh, from the grocery line, like you know, perspective. I was wondering if from farm to market to people, so that shortest circuit and, and having local farms uh, supplying food has any impact on your findings. Can you just repeat the last part of that question? If So essentially buying food from the a farmer's market and instead of going to the grocery store, um, buying uh, more sustainable meats from a farmer's market, do you think that have any impact on on your findings on having a sustainable diet? That's a really, really great point. Um, I'm curious, yeah, I, I'm not sure. It probably would have an impact. Um, I just, it's hard because the database I used for greenhouse gas emissions was a global database of life cycle assessment studies. And so there are different production practices that uh, you know, there were, you know, for example, life cycle assessments that considered whether beef was grain fed or grass fed and or organic or non organic, but these are all sort of averaged to get one value for one commodity. So there definitely is a lot of variation that could be there. It's just that my study didn't capture that because of um, the limitations of the, of the database that I used. Um, so I'm not sure if there are other studies that have looked specifically at, um, you know, buying meat from a farmer's market versus, you know, your conventional, you know, uh, store-bought meat, but, um, or food, but yeah, hopefully that sort of, um, addresses that as a limitation. Thank you very much, Olivia. Okay, let's move to, uh, Basak, who has his hand up, or their hand up, brother. Okay, just a second, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Olivia, thank you very much for this very interesting presentation uh, as I'm also doing a similar, um, you know, in, I have a similar interest in this research. Uh, so I am also looking into the food consumption in Canada and also the environmental impacts. So that's very interesting and very interesting findings as well. So I'm just a little bit curious about um, 
So I would like to chat with you more later on, but like about your presentation, I'm a little bit curious about how, what are the uh, major findings, like what you have found and versus uh, Rose et al study, which also conducted similar study in the North American context. So have you had a chance to compare them in terms of the nutrient intakes and like the food groups that's been consumed in the low and high ends so of greenhouse gas emission diets. So um, do you have any um, insights about that, like whether they are similar or whether they are different? Uh, what are your main, like, you know, preliminary findings? Compared to other studies that have been conducted? No, or? the one, uh, the one uh, Rose et al study, probably the one that's conducted yeah. in US, the database yeah. that we have also used that they were also using okay. a similar one and then similar approach they had. Um, so I'm curious whether, have you had a chance to compare the findings? And yeah. if yes, uh, what are the differences in terms of the nutrients and the food groups, whether they are similar or not? So I'm just curious okay. about that. Yeah, so definitely if you're familiar with that study, I have borrowed very heavily from that study. Um, and yeah, there, we had very similar findings. Um, so. Overall, the per capita carbon footprint of Canadian diets was 3.9. And in the US, they found that it was 4.7. So this is a big difference. Uh, this could be due to systematic differences or dietary patterns. Um, but uh, ultimately, when we corrected for total energy intake, they were very similar, um, around 2.2 uh, kilograms of CO2 equivalents per 1,000 calories. Um, we had pretty similar findings. So, you know, higher intakes of animal based foods for the high greenhouse gas diets, um, lower actually, well, no difference in, in things like poultry, lower intakes of grains uh, for the high greenhouse gas diets. Um, they also found that diet quality was higher for the low greenhouse gas diet group, but they used a different metric of for, for calculating overall diet quality, since they have the healthy eating index in the United States, which is validated with like NHANES, which is like the American equivalent to the CCHS, um, based on their dietary guidance. Right now, we don't have this metric yet for Canada for because of like the new food guide and everything. Um, so yeah, findings were, were actually very similar, um, which yeah, maybe may have to do with, you know, the fact that, you know, we're in North America, right? So um, yeah. So thank you very much. And I will, you know, reach out to you later on. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'm looking yeah. forward to it. <laughs> Great. Monica, would, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, Olivia, thanks. I was just wondering if you could comment on, uh, you said a limitation of the study was that there are other environmental impacts of, other than the greenhouse gases. So I could just, I was just wondering if you could comment on what are some of the other major environmental impacts that people should pay attention to. Like I heard about um, negative effects of clearing land for palm trees to make palm oil in a lot of unhealthy processed foods. So I was wondering if you could speak about that. Yeah, um, that yeah, that's a good point. So like there, like I mentioned at the beginning, like things like land use, water use, um, the meta analysis that I showed, they also looked at eutrophication, acidification, and um, some studies look at cumulative like energy demand and things like that. But it it, it it's really the, it's a big limitation. Like I, I would say greenhouse gases and land use are the two impacts that are most often looked at. But there's such a lack of data out there. And especially for Canada, this is like a major struggle um, in, in my research, or I'm sure a lot of people here who are doing interdisciplinary research have experienced this. There's, it's unfortunate. There's like a lot of, there's a lack of data in Canada for these types of things. Um, um, but what you mentioned about palm oil is very interesting because this is not something that typically I've seen in these types of studies on self-selected diets, like considering specific um, ingredients, uh, cause palm oil is typically, it's not, you know, it's, it's typically an ingredient in many foods and I haven't really seen that. And it's a big one because it's one of the most controversial, uh, you know, things out there right now, foods out there with, with, uh, deforestation and things. So there are a lot of other impacts to consider. It's just, there's a, there's a lack of data right now. So it's hard to take everything into account. Great, thank you. Khaled, 
you're, you're next. Okay, thank you, Alex. I will not be able to turn off my, my video. I have issues with that. But uh, Olivia, thank you for the presentation. That's just a great, I look forward to save the slides with me um, for future reference. And I'm looking at the same issue um, that you're looking at, but not for food, but rather looking at the life cycle uh, assessment of all the greenhouse gases. And I encountered a, a, a issue into how to convert the CH4 uh, um, emissions, for which farming is one of the greatest contributor, into CO2 equivalent. I would like to know if you face the same issue and how you dealt with that or what you can recommend for somebody who's going through this. This is, yeah, thank you for your question. This is very an, a very important consideration. So the database I used, they already had all the greenhouse gas emissions for commodities expressed in CO2 equivalents. So I did not have to do the conversion. Um, I think they used the global warming potential, the 100 year horizon uh, method. Um, but the yeah, the problem is like methane is a gas that is much more potent than carbon dioxide, but uh, you know, CO2 equivalent, it, it's one of the limitations of, of, of my study and I didn't mention it, but um, yeah, you're right. Like methane and livestock, you know, it, it's, it, it contributes a lot to agricultural emissions. And um, unfortunately CO2 equivalents do not necessarily capture uh, the fact that methane you know, causes these short-term spikes in temperature rise. It's just, it's just a metric of, of, of quantity. So this definitely is one of the limitations of, of my study. And if we were to have used a different metric, it could have led to different results. Uh, and the reason why we chose to use it is because it's, this is, the CO2 equivalence is used ubiqu ubiquitously across self-selected diet studies. So I'm sorry, I can't necessarily, uh, help you with that because it's, it, it was, like I mentioned, they were already converted uh, for me, but it is a limitation and it's important to, to, to say that, so. Th thank you, Olivia, for your answer. Thank you. Ola, did you have a, a question? Yes, I actually have a question to Veronica. Uh, uh, Veronica, you here? Oh, yes, thank you. Um, your presentation was very impressive and uh, you put a tremendous uh, work in, uh, in, uh, in presenting the topic. Uh, this is a very sensitive topic and uh, we know that uh, indigenous peoples have a lot to say uh, about climate change and they also have a lot of solutions for us, which we don't take into account and sometimes we just don't listen. And I was wondering, what would you recommend um, for us and for indigenous peoples to, uh, to do in this case, in this situation? How would you uh, make sure that we, uh, besides political will and other uh, issues, just put it that aside, just how we can collaborate? How do you see the collaboration based on, um, on the situation right now? Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, um, Orha. Um, well, while I was in Canada, I can I could observe some um, small groups, like for for example, um, is an indigenous circle which is in Thunder Bay that are trying to have this connection with the government institutions like. Uh, in this case, it's the health department in Thunder Bay. So they, they could uh, do um, some activities um, about food, about the um, food chain, um, about um, the, this indigenous knowledge, for example, they organize some um, uh, conferences or symposium or something like that uh, with ind distinct um, indigenous communities from them. Uh, from there, so uh, it was very interesting. I was uh, um, part from one of these events, and the indigenous peoples are 
always um, a by level to share the knowledge uh, with with others because they know the importance the, that have um, to to um, keep our land um, as health as possible. So um, this is the way I think the the right way to do is trying to connect these two groups from government and from indigenous peoples because sometimes uh, I feel like this, there is a separation there where indigenous peoples are living, okay, you are living there, bye. And government is implementing some policies that not always are um, accepted by indigenous peoples or, or they are conflicts, still they are conflict. there are conflicts about food access, for example, fishing, um, hunting and everything. There, there are a lot of in, uh, controls there uh, implemented by government. So it, if we don't have this capacity to join these two groups, um, the, represent, the representants from these two parts um, to have these conversations and to have some agreements about um, about land, which is the main problem there, and of course the the, the the access for food. So so I think this is the the solution: trying to join, to have conversations, to have conferences, and to put this kind of topics in academia also. Because if we don't discuss the neoliberal food regime, we are like, okay, closing our eyes to one strong reality, which is impacting all the planet, not, not, not just in Canada or in Ecuador, but in every, in every part of the planet. Um, India, for example, is one of the main examples of, of how um, corporations, of food corporations, are like okay displaced uh, indigenous peoples or uh, peoples who live there and causing a lot of massive health problems in small in, uh, communities for example in india and while we are okay it's, we have access for food in in fact uh, in one conference uh, i listened to someone who said okay we we have no enough food we are like uh, too much food <laughs> and um, and this is because this this cooperation situation that is affecting a lot of countries around the world. So if we discuss this in, in, in academia, we put these topics here and uh, we also share why we discuss here. We share outside, not just, okay, we are scholars, we are okay, we are researching, but uh, I think it is like a small word, a small bubble, where the knowledge is like keeping okay, yeah, okay, but it does it, it is not happening anything else. So what I am doing here in Ecuador is sharing this knowledge with, for example, going to the radio and speaking with the media and, uh, and in small groups in Facebook and to say, okay, I'm doing this and I am I am a, I'm a student and what I am learning says this. A lot of people just don't know what is happening with food around the world. So if we do not discuss here, if we do not try to have this, okay, uh, open eyes and to share this kind of two visions, um, it will be difficult for everybody. I, 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 I cannot say just for indigenous people, but, but for everyone. So when I, I listen, uh, uh, when um, I think it's Olivia who said, what is the, the, the problem when we buy products in farmers uh, markets or in this kind of great chains or markets um, and other stores, big stores. So it, it, it's different, it's so different. Uh, and this is one of the main aspects that Indigenous Food Cycle was exploring. And, and they said, okay, what is the problem when we go to buy in the farmer's market? First one is the prices because it is sometimes it's, it's quite uh, high the price, but it's but you don't know what is the, the effort that the farmers do to bring that products that are healthy products are uh, worked by head hands and everything. So yeah, a lot of, of, of issues that we can just analyze around, around food. And, that, and I think this is an amazing thing about food. <laughs> Thank you, Olga. Thank you. 
Um, I, that leads me to my question of, I know Olivia, I saw there was a bar in one of your graphs for game meat. And I was, I was wondering, because game meat is from hunting, from what I understand. So I know there's obviously a connection between indigenous uh, communities, game meat and carbon emissions. Uh, I wonder if you could, if you have any more information about the emissions of game meat and how that, how could we even quantify that? Um, yeah, that's a great point. I, I kind of like in classifying those those foods, uh, there were that grouping. So it was luncheon and other meats and it included game meat. Um, but to be honest, like the consumption of game meat in the CCHS uh, survey was very, very low. And I just sort of just like, I because I had to account for all foods consumed. So I kind of just like grouped it. Uh, with that group, but it mostly comes that the reason why that was a top source is because of like the pro more the processed meats, um, the sausages, the bacon and things like that. Um, but that's a great point. Um, and I think, unfortunately, like, I, I didn't really look at that in, in my in my research. And I, I guess I would say one of the problems is that I'm sort of looking at average Canadian diets, um, but this could differ very much from province to province, like I said, from person to person. And if we start like consider indigenous peoples and, and how and what they consume and, you know, some of them are in remote villages where it's hard to get it, where food access and food security becomes an issue. Um, I think that's a whole other topic that that could be explored. And I just, I unfortunately can't, can't really comment more than that. Um, but yeah, it's a good point and, and yeah, thanks. Thank you, it's totally understandable. Um, so this is the end of the session. Unfortunately, uh, Richard did not arrive, but gladly we had a good discussion. So we, we can continue the discussion on Wonder. I'll post the link in the chat right now. So, uh, we'll move on to there and then we'll have our next presentation session at uh, three o'clock. And it's the last one is international cooperation. So thank you to both presenters. That was a great discussion. And we'll see you later. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. And thanks, Alex, for the great moderation. All right. So Folks, uh, as you go off to wonder, have fun, enjoy. Go ahead and turn off your cameras here and go on over there. Have a hoot. Uh, we'll be here waiting for the next three folks to join us. I know that we've already tested the video of one, so we're looking for Dana, if you're in the crowd, Dana. Now's your chance, and Choyan as well. If you're here, I'll keep an eye out for you in the participants list.
All right, Dana, I see you've just uh, joined. I'll give you some time to open up your sound and video. I'm not sure if you can hear me yet, but once you can, please feel free to join me in the space here so that we can test your screen share before your panel begins. Hi, Dana. Hi, how are you, Anna? I'm well, how are you? Good, thank you. Good, great. Would you like to uh, give it a go? Make sure everything's working well? Yeah, sure, let's do that. Okay. Uh, yeah, too many, uh, let me see. I'm not the best in those things. That's okay, we have time. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yeah, let's close the other one. So, no, why? Here we go. Yep. Can you see it? Yep. Do you want to just go full screen? So yes. we'll ensure we're not seeing yeah. presenter view. Yeah. Yep. That looks great. Okay. That's wonderful. Thank you. So shall I keep it like this? Until... No, no. You could close it now and. Okay, I'm going to we'll invite the moderator then. to uh, yeah. give some opening remarks first. Sure. Okay, so your your other the other two presenters on your panel, I am being told, are also here. Well, I see, I see that they're here. We've already tested somebody else's um, screen share, so we'll just wait for uh, Chuyan to also come on board. Neas, you're good to go. I'm right here. You're right here. And we know your presentation is beautiful. All is well. <laughs> so that's great. So kind. Hi, Dana. Hi, Anna. Hi, Ola. It's my colleague <laughs> from the same supervisor. Awesome. Um, the other name, the uh, Saha, uh, who logged in under my name, could you please uh, change your name? So we um, know that this is you. So how? Uh, they might have, uh, Douglas might have not disabled this for the moment. So we will have to change. Uh, yeah. yeah, there you go. Try now. Hi, Saha. I see you, but you're under my name. Would you mind to change it, please? Can you do that? <laughs> so how can I change my name? So if you just hover, go onto your video of you. And um, on the right-hand side, you'll see three little dots in a blue square. That's a drop down menu, and one of the options is rename. If not, uh, we can do it for you. Yeah, you can. It's like saying more. When you, when you put on the name, it says more. You click on it, and it says rename. I, I'm doing it for you. You now. should see that. Okay, I'm looking for. Do you I'm... see it? It's okay. I, I've done it. Awesome. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Anna. You're the best. No problem. Anna, uh, who's first? Uh, who presents first? I, I believe Dana is the first presenter based on the schedule that I have. Um, so I guess I'm at 3 p.m. Yes, right? Dana. Thank you. Is, Daddy, it Dana? Minutes, is it 10 minutes sharp? Very sharp. They're very strict around here, Dana. They're, they have a very tight schedule. So right? <laughs> we just black out the screen after 10 minutes. Um, usually the moderator, if you are running long, will in fact jump in and, and kind of interject and interrupt you. Um, okay. To ensure we have time for everyone. So if you could stick to the a lot of time, that would be wonderful. Dana, you can join us in Wonder if you want to for 
the past six minutes. We are all there. Do you have the link? The link is in the chat, actually. You can see it. Go ahead, join us. Ola, you're mod moderating this one? Yes, correct. Well, I am. Okay. I'm leaving it in your very capable hands. All right. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, we have almost one minute. Let me post a message to everyone.
All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is a session about international cooperation. And I'm pleased to introduce today's presenters. So we have Dana Grandeur, uh, and Xavier de Oliveira Jr., and uh, Shoyon uh, Saha. I'm sorry if I apologize right away if I mispronounce your names. <laughs> Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. So in the end, uh, we will have a Q&A session. Um, in the meanwhile, if you have questions, please uh, post them uh, in chat or raise your hand. So it is my pleasure to introduce, uh, to invite uh, Dana Grandeur uh, from the Department of Economics uh, at Concordia. She's my colleague. Uh, we have the same uh, thesis supervisor, Dr. Frasini Diamantodi. Uh, today, she's going to present her search about environmental cooperation and trade, the impact of heterogeneity on environmental damages. Dana, you have the floor. Thank you, Olga. Hello, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. So as Hola mentioned, I'm working on environmental cooperation and trade with a specific focus on heterogeneity on environmental damage, along with my supervisor, Professor Ifrasni Diamantudi. This research examines environmental cooperation among heterogeneous trading partners to analyze the feasibility of partial and global international environmental agreements strong incentives to free ride and difficulties in enforcing international environmental agreements, IEAs, make international cooperation a challenging task. In the context of international trade, government face the trade-off of higher taxes to cooperatively reduce emissions or higher tariffs on export when acting non-cooperatively. Recent empirical evidence suggests that countries with different levels of development witness different trade effects on environmental quality. In terms of heterogeneity, environmental cooperation among heterogeneous countries provide significant overall welfare gains. Our preliminary findings suggest that heterogeneous countries, despite their differences, can reap environmental and overall welfare gains when setting emission taxes cooperatively. The grand coalition is stable under certain conditions, and the collective welfare gains derived from the grand coalition increase with the degree of heterogeneity. With respect to the theoretical literature, the three such contributes and connects two branches of the theoretical literature the one on environmental cooperation and trade, and the other on international environmental agreements. Connecting to the theoretical literature on environmental cooperation and international trade, scholars have long examined the effect of heterogeneity in two country trade models. They found that environmental cooperation among heterogeneous countries provided significant overall welfare gains. This paper is comparable to the one developed by Baxi and Chaudhuri 2017, who focused on environmental damage heterogeneity, yet in a two country repeated game. They used trigger strategies and border tax adjustments to assess the robustness of environmental cooperation. On the other hand, we consider a three stage static coalition formation game with three countries. The sustainability of environmental coordination is based on internal and external stability criteria as developed by Daspomont et al. in 1983, rather than exogenous trigger strategies and trade linkages. When it comes to the literature on international environmental agreements, heterogeneity in pure IEAs does not increase the size of stable coalition and can reduce the likelihood of cooperation. Heterogeneity, on the other hand, when associated with trade linkages, such as trade sanction, can reduce free riding incentive and increase the size of stable coalitions. 
Few scholars like Kavanyak and Chekvosian in 2017 have examined the formation and stability of IEAs among heterogeneous trading partners. They found that market size heterogeneity fostered the formation of partial rather than global agreements. This paper is comparable to Kavanyak and Shekvosian in 2017. Using different stability criteria, however, we focus on environmental damage rather than market size heterogeneity in a segmented market setting with import tariff rather than a free trade uh, setting. Defining the model, we have three countries, I, J, and K, with different environmental damage parameters. Each country has only one farm producing a homogeneous product. Total production of the farm located in country I, for example, XI, is composed of three arguments, XII, the one intended for local production, XIJ, produced in I, exported to J, and XIK, that, are, that part of total production produced in country I and exported to country K. The production process generates transboundary pollution, such as CO2. Every unit produced generates exactly one unit of global emission. So there is a constant ratio between production and pollution and emission. The firm's choice variable is production or emissions. Abatement as such is not modeled as a separate choice variable, but foregone profit is the farm abatement cost. Farms compete a la Corneau in a segmented market. Each farm faces its own demand domestically, represented by QI is equal to alpha minus PI, where QI is total consumption of the good in country I. For simplification and to make the model more tractable, it is assumed that the marginal cost of production is equal to zero. Each farm can export to the other two markets at no shipping cost. Pollution generates environmental damage in each country, represented by DI, which is a function of aggregate production and the environmental damage of the country in question. Beta I, being the marginal environmental damage in country I caused by aggregate production. So we are dealing in transboundary pollution rather than local pollution. Each country can use import tariff as a trade policy tool to protect local production. Tau I is the exogenous tariff imposed by the government in country I on imports from foreign farms. There are no transfer payments between countries. Fiscal revenue collected by a government remain in the state of origin. Each government uses a pay, a per unit production or emission tax rate, TI, as an environmental policy tool imposed by the government in country I on the local farm. Now, consumer surplus is nothing but one half consumption in a particular market squared. Firms profit is composed of um, revenues collected from each part of total production, local production, revenues from export to country J, revenues from export to country K, and each one is um, evaluated at the a particular market price. We have a segmented market approach. The firm has to pay um, taxes on every single type of production, all local production, and it has to pay tariff to foreign exports. Pollution tax paid by the firm in country I is TIXI, and these are collected by the government in country I as a form of emission tax revenue. The other source of revenue for the government in country I would be revenues from tariff on imports, which is tau I, the tariff imposed by country I on imports coming from the foreign market J and the foreign market K. All three components, consumer surplus, firms profit, revenues collected by the government, minus environmental damage from aggregate production, of course, constitutes the welfare of country I. Now, the model is composed of three stages static coalition game. 
And the third, and it is solved by backward induction. In the third stage, each farm chooses non-cooperatively the output rate by maximizing the farm's profit. So those farms are behaving in a Cournot manner and they will be maximizing profit at a rate of output behaving non-cooperatively. Stage three is common to all coalition structures. In stage two, each coalition sets an emission tax rate by maximizing the coalition welfare. And in stage one, the stability of each coalition structure is analyzed. A note now, when independently of the coalition structure that is um, formed in stage two, the farms are uh, solving a non-cooperative profit maximizing problem. Looking at stage two, when we have three countries, um, then we have three possible coalition structures. We have the grand coalition that is composed of all three countries. The grand coalition would be stable if no one has an incentive to leave the coalition. The partial coalition, we have two members joining the coalition and a third member that will remain an outsider. Now, the partial coalition would be stable if none of the members, I and J, for example, have an incentive to leave, or if the outsider has no incentive to join the partial coalition composed of I, J. The, second, the third structure that is possible, and that would be the singleton structure, each firm and each country is behaving non-cooperatively, as a singleton. And in that case, the singleton would be stable if none of these um, singleton structure have an incentive to join another member. Simulation results. Um, we, uh, I have looked at different uh, simulations um, and with different degrees of heterogeneity. I have defined the degree of heterogeneity to be the difference between let beta i be greater than beta j be greater than beta k. So I have taken the degree of heterogeneity to be the difference between the highest environmental damage parameter minus the lowest environmental damage parameter divided by the average of these. So beta i, beta k divided by two. So we find that Whenever the degree of heterogeneity is less or equal to 0 0.6, um, the, uh, the grand coalition is stable. The, um, there are two kinds of restrictions that has been imposed on the model. The first type of restriction would be that every country need to produce a positive, strictly positive quantity, and therefore the market structure of the um, is maintained throughout the model. And the other type of restriction that we have imposed is that whenever there is an environmental coalition that is being formed, they have to agree on a positive or a zero tax rate allowing for corner solution. That is whenever the grand coalition is formed or a partial coalition is formed, um, the tax rate imposed by that coalition need, does not allow for a subsidy. So a positive or a zero tax rate need to be imposed on emission. So if these conditions are valid, the grand and the partial coalition have a tax rate that is greater or equal to zero, we see that under different degrees of heterogeneity until we reach 60%, the grand coalition is stable, whereas production is lowest under the grand coalition, meaning emissions are lowest under the grand coalition. And of course, welfare, collective welfare is highest under the grand coalition. Um, what happens when the degree of heterogeneity exceeds 60% or 0.6? We can see that the partial coalition between the two countries with the highest environmental damage parameter, in our case, these countries are I and J, um, will be stable. Of course, by maintaining that uh, the grand coalition 
has a positive tax rate and the partial coalition also has a positive tax rate. Again, we see the partial coalition environmental gains are less than the one that we would have under the grand coalition. But of course, we are still better off in terms of emissions on, uh, compared to the singleton structure. Similarly, the welfare, a collective welfare that we would have under the partial coalition would be halfway in between, between um, what we would have under the singleton, but it would be less than what we would get in terms of the grand coalition. Different types of heterogeneity have also been uh, examined. So we have looked at the uh, completely homogeneous case the limited heterogeneity case, where we have two countries having the same environmental damage parameters, and the third one would be different, or the case where all three countries are different, of course, with beta i greater than beta j, also be, uh, greater than beta k. So when all three of them are homogeneous, we have two stable structure, the singleton and the grand coalition, because these are stable in a sense by default. The tax rate that would be prevailing under the grand coalition, of course, is way higher than the tax rate that would prevail under the singleton. Dana, I apologize. Uh, you have one minute left. Sure, I'm almost yeah. done. Uh, under limited heterogeneity, the grand coalition is also stable with a degree of heterogeneity less than 60% or equal to 60%. And of course, when we have stronger heterogeneity with three different parameters, the grand coalition is also stable. Under the three scenarios, we can see that emissions are least under the grand coalition and welfare is most significant under the grand coalition. Thank you. If there is one thing that this uh, pandemic has taught us is that when it comes to a global threat, be it a pandemic or be it pollution, transboundary pollution, we are in this together and we are definitely better off working together. Thank you, Dana. Uh, I'll invite Eneas Xavier de Oliveira Jr. Uh, with his presentation, uh, La Participation de la Société Civile, au Conference des Nations Unies sur le Climat. Inès, you have the floor. Thank you. Can you follow? Yes. Try again. Yes, we do. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, bonjour à toutes et à tous. Uh, I must confess, I initially pre uh, prepared the slides in French, but as the presentations uh, have gone on, uh, all in English, I quickly translated the slides. Uh, my name is Enes Xavier. I'm an environmental lawyer in Brazil. I have always worked with uh, environmental NGOs and with uh, participatory democracy at the local level. And now I'm bringing into work a greater project uh, concerning a uh, level a little bit higher uh, regarding climate change. Thank you so much for this opportunity. The presentations so far have been all awesome. You are all fabulous. And this is my summary, which I will bring into work right now. Uh, so, the title of my work is Civil Society Participation in the, nation, uh, in the United Nations Climate Conferences. This is the provisional title of my doctoral research thesis. The research is still in an uh, initial phase. The pandemic has been a major challenge. I'm, uh, for example, I'm still in Brazil. Uh, I hope I have the opportunity to attend the next COP in Glasgow and the following events. Uh, representing NGOs, perhaps, uh, to broaden my research. However, I'm glad to introduce some important elements capable of promoting some reflections. Hmm. Climate change is a real threat based on scientific certainty. 
It means that uh, in recent decades, the scientific community has devoted itself to researchers in order to understand this phenomenon, which uh, at its, its core, it is a natural phenomenon. Nonetheless, it represents, uh, it presents a high degree of human interference. And uh, it puts the existence of humanity in jeopardy. The effects of climate change are also recognized. The damage affects, uh, affects everyone globally. Climate change knows no borders, no boundaries. In this approach, measures and solutions are required at the international and transnational level with the joint efforts of all states. Uh, that also represents a consensus. Uh, of course, there are other visions. However, the negationist vision and uh, conspiracy theories are not uh, the subject of this presentation, not part of the research. Well, in the legal field, which concerns us, uh, the, debate, uh, the debates take place mainly at the United Nations, which has been cons uh, consolidated uh, since the post-war period as the main international political and legal forum for the debate of subjects that concern the entire international community. The first major international convention regarding the environment was held in 1972 in Stockholm. In the 80s, important uh, uh, works were published, such as uh, Our Common Future, published by the Brundtland Commission, which introduced us with the concept of sustainable development Montreal has hosted its uh, meetings itself dealing uh, with the uh, ozone layer, but it was not until 1992 that the United, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change uh, has been conceived as the main legal basis for the international effort against uh, climate change. Uh, but what has happened since then? If there is a scientific and legal recognition of climate change as and it, it affects, uh, if uh, the urgency of the debate is recognized and the need for action to reverse uh, this imminent threat is also rec recognized, why is climate change persisting? Why is the scenario as a whole getting worse? Uh, well, one possible answer lies uh, in the gaps uh, in the international legal framework. Efforts are concentrated on the role of the state, taking into account the traditional uh, international law, uh, which considers uh, the state as legal subject, which uh, in the exercise of its sovereignty takes decisions uh, independently, of course, but mainly in a political way. Uh, the work carried out uh, in the conferences of parties is characterized by the progress and the setbacks of positions adopted by each member accordingly to the political position and their respective head uh, of state and government. Debates are generally polarized and it is difficult to reach consensus on the technical language used in the bodies of uh, official documents involving obligations and the policies to be adopted. However, uh, well, uh, if you take, for example, uh, the Paris Agreement, uh, it is the state of art of the climate debate uh, the most comprehensive and uh, about international climate change arrangement, which combines the university, uh, universality of uh, UN members into commitment targets. But uh, the agreement itself uh, does not provide specific positions regarding an um, effective role of society, of civil society. So, uh, the failures of a system that simultaneously addresses the complexity of environment problems and the difficulty of interstate relations also calls uh, for the reflection for new solutions. And the public opinion is calling for far reaching measures to deal with the situation. Uh, we're working on the assumption that uh, international legal structure currently in place 
to deal with climate change has proven to be flawed. The provisions uh, do not provide uh, the participation of uh, civil society in the decision-making process. Uh, and environmental law con uh, contains a uh, political nature of universalist vocation to calls for the cooperation of states and the advent of legal rules and nurtures a new political culture to, of participation outside traditional uh, democratic fame, uh, frameworks. And the objective is to adopt mechanisms for civil society participation in the decision-making process. Uh, the centralized vision of the state as, and its institutions as the sole and legitimate source of power is challenged by the existing legal order. Uh, it proves it, it, uh, itself uh, ineffective in achieving uh, practical and concrete solutions. Uh, it, it, it's not a proposal to abolish uh, the order in force, but to complement it uh, while considering uh, new realities, new actors and new institutional uh, conceptions that challenge the traditional vision. Uh, I, I'm willing to uh, adopt, to consider a postmodern approach and a legal pluralism uh, approach uh, I confess I have uh, considered other uh, approaches. Uh, this uh, piece of work defies the structures of a traditional law. I consider even the Marxist uh, approach, but uh, I don't want to abolish the state uh, nor the uh, legal in, uh, international legal uh, structure, but uh, I search for a transformation. Uh, So, uh, in theory, we want the recognition of a civil society as legal subject within the climate debate, the decentralization of political power, uh, a plurality of social actors, uh, political socialization, and participatory democracy. It, 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 all, it all regards uh, the postmodern approach. And regarding methodological uh, resources and uh, interdisciplinarity, uh, cost lawyering uh, brings us a political and legal engagement typ uh, typically that defies environmental uh, issues. And I believe these uh, tools uh, can help us to achieve uh, the established goals. Uh, to finish my, presenta my presentation, I would like to bring you uh, three pictures. Uh, this has been taken uh, in Rio Plus 20 in 2012. It was, uh, this was a preparatory uh, uh, meeting, uh, counting on the participation of many uh, professionals. Uh, there were, for example, Mr. Bryce Lalonde, uh, former um, uh, Minister of the Environment of France, and Professor Michel Pierre, professor, professor at l'Université de Limoges. Uh, another picture uh, now within the, the Rio Plus 20 meeting uh, with uh, participants of the civil society. And we all came out with uh, suggestions for a final document. And somehow, uh, it's curious to think this way, uh, the leaders and head of states and government, uh, they did not uh, uh, take into account the suggestions made by civil society. And these were the prot uh, prot uh, protests that uh, was followed. Uh, there is a sign here written in Portuguese, for example, Rio plus 20, uh, uh, decide not to decide is a decision that represents the destruction of nature and human. And that uh, illust illustrates uh, uh, very well the conflict that we find ourselves right now regarding the legal structure that considers the states in the uh, decision uh, making process, but excludes uh, the participation of civil society. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Aeneas. Uh, now, uh, there would be Hoyon Saha. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. I apologize if I don't. Uh, with a presentation about assess, assessing and amplifying the role of least developed countries in confronting the climate crisis, we are winding down fossil fuel supply. Please go ahead, Saha. Saha, please unmute yourself. So can you hear me right now? Yes, we do. Okay. So can you see my slide? Uh, we see the, yes, now we see, yes. Okay. Thank you. First, I'm introducing myself. I am Jan Saha and I'm actually from South Asia, Bangladesh. And right now I am a PhD candidate in Balsley School of International Affairs, University of Waterloo. So the presentation that I'm going to, uh, I'm going to actually present today, this is a truncated version of my PhD research that right now I'm conducting. So the, my title, so my title is assessing and amplifying the role of least developed countries in confronting the climate crisis by winding down or facing out fossil fuel supply or production, whatever we, we say actually. So this is the structure of my presentation in which I will sequentially present. First, I will explain the background. Second, the paradox or contradictory situations that currently least developed countries occupy. Third, I will briefly explain my research question and fourth, research significance and then theoretical framework. And last, I will tell my methodological approach for this research. So, fossil fuel and the climate crisis. Since the industrial revolution, fossil fuel as the primary source of energy has played a predominant role in the acceleration of capitalist development, as we already know. So burning fossil fuel has accelerated the concentration of greenhouse gases in the Earth atmosphere and altered the planet climate trajectory. Emissions gap report reveals that CO2 emissions in 2019 have reached a record of more than 52 gigatons of carbon dioxide, in which CO2 emissions from fossil fuel sector contributed around 38 gigatons of carbon dioxide. That means around 75% CO2 emissions actually comes from fossil fuel sectors. The exponential growth in greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuel is right now a major challenge for keeping the global average temperature within 1.5 degrees Celsius. The rapid rise in global temperature changes the earth climate and has already created diverse natural catastrophes like that flooding, heat waves, pro, uh, drought, tropical cyclones, and they have other cascading effects like that water scarcity, loss of livelihood, infrastructures, and damages or harm, uh, harmful effect on ecosystem services. So, who emit the most greenhouse gas emissions in the world? In total greenhouse gas emissions, the group of G20 countries that is constituted by both developed and developing nations, they are actually responsible for 78% of greenhouse gas emissions. On the other hand, the poorest and least developed countries, they are responsible for 7% greenhouse gas emissions in the world. So in the context of the principal and dominant role of fossil fuel in creating the global climate crisis, there has been an increasing pressure from civil society organizations, non-governmental organizations, advocacy groups, educational institutions, and other different stakeholders to phase out fossil fuel production and supply. In response to the transnational and global call and the least contribution of least developed countries, they are right now 
at the forefront of exerting influence and pressure over G20 countries to reduce the emissions level by phasing out fossil fuel. And they are exerting their pressure during the UNFCC negotiations and conference of parties, that means COP meetings and LDC group, least developed countries group ministerial meetings and their annual summit. While they are urging G20 countries that you should reduce the emissions level by phasing out fossil fuel, or you should reduce the production of fossil fuel, simultaneously some least developed countries, they are actually expanding their own fossil fuel sector and they are taking initiative to develop the fossil fuel projects. And in the development of their fossil fuel project, they are receiving the support and assistance from the same G20 countries like that China, Japan and United Kingdom and other South, uh, South Korea and India also. So my study aims to examine this paradox that I have already told in my previous slide, the contradictory positions of least developed countries. So my PhD aims to examine this paradox by asking three specific questions. The first question, how and why least developed countries are exerting pressure or influence over G20 countries to reduce the supply and production of fossil fuel? Second, how least developed countries are justifying their development of own fossil fuel project and own fossil fuel sectors? And why and how G20 countries are promoting the fossil fuel sector in least developed world? What are the major reasons behind this expansion? And third, how G20 supports for the fossil fuel expansion in least developed world, we can redirect toward the transition to a low carbon energy system. So my research significance, my study will contribute to the existing scholarship on the supply side climate policies and the politics and energy politics and climate politics of least developed countries. Second, my study will fill the scholarly gap by examining the unexplored paradoxical political position occupied by least developed countries. And third, my study will explore the pathways or initiatives how we can govern the LDC's energy transition to a low carbon energy system. So examine my paradox and the research, the research question, I will depend on two theoretical frameworks. First, one strategic approach to power and the second one is global political economy of energy transition. Strategic approach to power, this framework is built by Cepla detail. And this framework actually provides an important insight into public, private and hybrid networks strategically carrying out an crucial functions and functioning of state behavior in global climate change politics. And this approach is actually concerned with competing transnational coalition like that civil society organizations, how civil society or least developed countries are building their coalitions with other small island countries or other state, states to make realistic solution in global climate change politics. And the second framework is actually built by Peter Newell global political economy of energy transition. This framework focuses on the role of state, finance, and global governance institution in energy transition. First, state. State has convening power to formulate transition plans, administer policy tools, and promote research, innovations, and development for the energy transition. And second, transnational finance has transformative power to facilitate technological development for energy transition. And the last one, last component of this theoretical framework is global governance institution like that UNFCC, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change or UN Energy System or IEA, International Energy Agency. They have significant role in setting new rules, mobilizing new finance, creating new infrastructures and coordinating functions for energy transition in the least developed world. So this is my methodology. So to examine my research questions and conduct my study, I have selected Bangladesh. This is a least developed country. 
And I have been select, I have selected this country from 46 least developed countries because Bangladesh is right now influential in 46 least developed countries in terms of four parameters. First, Bangladesh, this country has the highest gross domestic product and Bangladesh is right now in leader, uh, they are actually leading to international, or, uh, to international climate organization like the climate vulnerable, uh, climate vulnerable forums. And third one is climate adaptation policies. And the last one is Bangladesh is right now massively expanding, expanding their own fossil fuel sector. And I am applying a mixed method approach for this research. First one, I will, I will apply qualitative interviews, semi-structured interviews. Second one, I will analyze the case of Bangladesh. And third, I will actually Third approach is participant observation in COP meetings, and I will visit some fossil fuel sites in Bangladesh. And I am planning to conduct 50 state, 50 semi structured interviews with state and non state actors. To analyze my qualitative data, I first I will follow the three stages. First one, I will transcribe and translate the recorded conversation with interviews. Second, I will analyze this data by using and we will call it software. And then last one, I will interpret the data following thematic analysis. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you everyone for uh, your presentations. It's very interesting. And I wonder if our audience have any questions. Does anyone have questions? Uh, while we are waiting for the questions from the audience, I have a question to you. Um, it's more like a general question to, have to all of you since you all work in the international cooperation. And we know it's difficult to uh, enhance that cooperation. Uh, but you all work in, uh, in that direction, you, including myself. And uh, I was wondering, what would you suggest would be the way out to enhance the international cooperation on uh, climate change and basically reduce the lobbying of fossil fuel sector um, let's say to to decrease the the political influence um, in this in the in the area of uh, fossil fuels yeah uh, your question is very important but it is very difficult to reduce the level of fossil fuel production because it actually really needs the international cooperation, particularly the co cooperation between big emitters like that first, first cooperation actually needs between United States and China. They are the, China is the first emitters and they have right now more than 25,000 of coal fired power plants, biggest emitter. And the second, so the cooperation is really difficult. So in that sense, UNFCC or United Nations, they have to play a strong role, but the state sovereignty is major difficulties to make international cooperation. I'm just coming to the point of previous presentation of Javier. So he already makes the political and uh, inter uh, willingness of state. So cooperation, cooperation between the states is really important to tackle the climate change or reduce the production level of fossil fuel. Thank you, Sahad. Does anyone want to add to that to that question? Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with Saha and Xavier when it comes to fossil fuel, for example. Yes, we see that China, which is the world's largest emission, um, has pledged, for example, uh, zero carbon neutrality, but yet promoting investment in fossil fuel, not only in China, but abroad. We see that Canada and the United States, for example, are still subsidizing uh, oil production, be it in Alberta or elsewhere. Um, I think like Xavier mentioned, there is an increasing role on civil society today to put pressure on local uh, government. We have seen during the past two years that um, there is um, more pressure coming from the young, for, from uh, early adults and uh, putting pressure on, I think there is a great role to be played by civil societies um, 
in order to achieve like larger cooperation, because obviously the states alone, uh, many, for example, of the signatories of the Paris agreements uh, have not even met their Paris pledges. Um, and these are important emitters, be it Saudi Arabia or Turkey, all of, the, all of these are also uh, oil producers. Um, so yeah, I think there is a, a really important role on the civil society to, to advance the pressure and reduce the lobbying uh, of the um, fossil fuel industry. But the problem is that uh, the lobbying power of civil society is uh, comparatively lower than the power of fossil fuel industries. And their lobbying is actually immense level. The lobbying and they have actually appointing the specific lobbyists and they are investing lots of funds to lobby in the United Nations cooperations when they actually occur the climate summit. So the power of fossil fuel industries are immense than the civil society organizations. Uh, yeah, that's true. That's a very good question. And I agree with the colleagues. A uh, fossil fuel lobby is very eff effective. And uh, usually their power to conduct the political agenda is very strong. Very strong. Uh, yeah. And uh, well, it's sad to recognize that uh, a corporation usually loses place when another corporation comes into the game. So uh, fortunately, we are seeing uh, some new measures, legal measures taken uh, uh, into account, for example, uh, ele uh, electric uh, sources instead of uh, fossil fuel uh, sources. So it, it's good to, to know that. Uh, anyhow, uh, civil society has always play, uh, played a, a major role uh, putting pressure on the uh, politicians, uh, yes, they have made a good job achieving uh, a lot of uh, treaties and uh, environmental uh, protection, but yet there is a huge, uh, far away uh, 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 structure to be modified. Yes, and excellent. We have a lot of work to do. Yes, and Javier, I'm just adding to you and in my actual, I had a comprehensive exam in global environmental governance, and I read a book, Art System Governance, Frank Behrman. He is actually arguing that United Nations should restructure and reform their institutional structure. And United Nations should give a space for civil society organization in the UN meeting. So he is actually arguing to empowering the civil society to tackle the climate change. I, I want to add something. I know we're always, even within the United Nations structure, we're always focusing on the consumption side when it comes to pollution yeah. and emission. So today, yes, we are always focusing on replacing electric cars, reducing pollution from transportation, and, uh, and uh, focusing on the green side at the consumption level. But yes, what happens to the production level? So when I am um, today, the way we're measuring emissions is uh, at the end of the, a gallon of oil, for example, that is pr being produced in Canada, that gallon of oil at its production source emits and pollute. But we are always measuring the pollution that comes when we use that gallon of oil, whether it is in the car or in the airplane or whatever. So in a sense, we should be also focusing when it comes to fossil fuel in particular at reducing emissions that are not only being measured in time at the consumption, but at the production site when they are first being emitted. And um, I think there is a lot of work to be done uh, in terms of reducing uh, consumption, in terms of uh, reducing emission at the production, not only focusing on the green side of consumption. Very well said, Dana. Thank you so much, everyone. Okay, we I have a question add, from Dana? audience. Yes, Saha, would you like to add? Okay. I'm just adding a point with Dana. Uh, we know that in 2015, Paris Climate Agreement for the reducing the production of fossil fuel 
or supply of fossil, they don't utter or they, they don't mention the word of fossil fuel. And the last couple of days, G7 countries, they have actually met in United Kingdom. They are arguing to investing for renewable energy. Okay, that's fine. But they don't argue about the reduction of fossil fuel. Exactly, exactly. My so this, is a, this is a big political game. And, exactly. you know, and, the, and G7 countries, they have actually taken a platform like the Build Back Better World. So this is for challenging, challenging just only China, Belt and Road Initiatives. Exactly, exactly. That so, they want us to use like greener methods, yeah. but at the same time, you guys are subsidizing all production in yes. the in other states, like yeah. whether it, so, yeah. They don't specifically tell about the production side. Uh, and the sadly, production. the framework of the United Nations measures emission at the consumption source and not at the production source. This is amazing discussion. And I'm sorry to interrupt you yes. for a moment, but we have long waiting question from the audience. Uh, we have a question from Etienne. Etienne, okay. please unmute yourself and ask a question. Yes, uh, thank you, Ola. Um, I have a question that's uh, like pretty much pretty not so different, but also very different from the discussion that's going on right now. Uh, the question is for Dana and also for Ola, because you two pre present models that uh, make the same assumptions. And I couldn't ask it to Ola in the pre previous panel. Um, the question is about the assumption that uh, welfare and GDP are associated in the model. So um, my, my own research led me uh, to uh, read a lot of literature that shows that uh, GDP is a very imperfect indicator of uh, welfare and well-being at the society level. And that, for example, in the United States in the past, uh, I'm not, not sure how many decades, but in the, in the past decades, increases in GDP have also been associated with large increases in the inequality of uh, distribution of wealth and income. So my question uh, is, have you considered uh, this, uh, the fact that GDP is a very imperfect indicator of uh, welfare, uh, the implications of that for the results of the model that you are using? I must confess that I did not follow everything in terms of the, the inner workings of the model? I mean, uh, in terms of welfare calculation, I try to stick, uh, you can see I don't have a particular format, but the welfare uh, equation is from the market structure and the flow of trade between the trading partners. So um, that, is, um, for example, a difference between my welfare equation and Olia's welfare equation. Um, but in a way, uh, that welfare, um, if you want that welfare equation, uh, we subtract, for example, environmental damage, which is definitely under normal, um, if you want, GDP calculation, uh, pollution, which is and externality would not be unless the farm is paying for the cost of pollution, which is not, would not be a part of the welfare calculation. So uh, sadly, we haven't had the time to discuss in detail the components of the welfare equation. But for example, consumer surplus is being diminished by environmental damage that is a function of transboundary pollution. So in a sense, also under the single st structure, all three countries, due to that environmental damage that is a function of transboundary pollution, not only local production, uh, we, we're gonna see that under the single st structure, when all three countries are behaving non-cooperatively, they have a negative welfare function because the pollution damage, whether we want to extrapolate it to climate change and all the consequences is severely, is very important, leading to a very negative welfare function. Um, so in that sense, when we try to have a welfare function that 
reflect the trade flows between the country and reflects three components. Again, I haven't had time to show you how when we move, for example, from a singleton structure to a grand coalition, who are the main losers and who are the ones who benefit from the agreement? Because basically those who benefit most are the consumers and those who are uh, um, hurt the most are, are the farms, are the polluting farms to start with. So the movement from a singleton structure to the grand coalition is changing, um, if you want, the different welfare components of the three um, arguments of the welfare, be it the, the government, be it uh, the consumer or the farms in terms of profit. Um, but uh, in that sense, this is the best we can do in our case, in my case, for example, I'm focusing on environmental damage heterogeneity. So I'm trying to focus on one type of heterogeneity at a time. And in that sense, we find that a welfare equation that best reflect two things, the market structure, we are dealing in a corner oligopoly, and the trade flows that are moving around uh, between the countries. So, um, and that in a sense, uh, to be able to focus on two things occurring at the same time, we, we wouldn't want to add a different uh, aspect or a variable that could, uh, if you want, dilute the effect of the very uh, variable we are trying to focus on. Very well said, Dana. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'll move to another question because we are running out of time. Uh, Veronica, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you so much. And congratulations to the panelists. Uh, great, great job. <laughs> um, my question is about, uh, I, I'm not sure if you spoke about the Yasuni Itete initiative in Ecuador. We had um, this initiative in 2007. Um, the, the main point of this was to um, keep over a billion barrels of oil in the ground under the Yasuni National Park. At the end, uh, failed. The thing was failed because uh, the, the government in that time like, just said, okay, um, we can offer a perpetual suspension of oil extraction in part of the Yasuni uh, in return for payments of $3.6 billion from the international community. <laughs> That's why it's failed. Um, so my question is how the development um, concept affect in this kind of uh, research, for example, uh, we, if we speak about the indigenous communities in the Amazon, uh, they want to be developed. So how the developed concept impact this kind of initiatives? Who would like to address? Who wants to give it a shot? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if you are ready, it's-, it's, it's oh, ready. Okay. Uh, well, that's uh, pretty much knowing the winning ticket. Uh, 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 it's a very good question and the answer is hard to, to bring it. Uh, well, we all know that, uh, for example, sustain, sustainable development uh, is a concept that brings us uh, three uh, fundamental uh, concepts, uh, three uh, pillars. The, uh, social, economic, and uh, environmental uh, pillars. They were supposed to stand together in the measure that social would, uh, a society would be, uh, will uh, meet prosperity economically, uh, uh, protecting their environment. But uh, as, for example, as we are facing a, a pandemic, and uh, there always a hunger for profit. That's the word, that's how it is. Uh, how can we still protect the, the, the environment when there are many, many people suffering and can, they cannot make a, a, a living? So usually the environmental protection, uh, they, they are forgotten. 
totally forgotten. And usually the indigenous people, they, uh, they usually, they are not taken into account in the political agenda. For example, in Brazil, the Amazon tribes, they are totally uh, forgotten and they were left on their own with no political support, uh, nor economic support. So uh, it's hard to manage the different interests. And uh, just to be, uh, uh, I would like to quickly uh, add something to what uh, Etienne has asked very quickly. Uh, measuring and calculating welfare and GDP, uh, they are usually economic uh, elements but there are other concepts that should be taken into account. For example, happiness. Who, who don't want to be happy? Uh, for example, uh, environmental protection, biodiversity, and access to environmental good. For example, in Brazil, it's probably the 10th biggest economy in the world. We are again facing access to water scarcity. How come? <laughs> Oh. That doesn't match. Wow. This discussion can take days and days. Uh, it's so interesting. Uh, I am so sorry to unfortunately stop you there because <laughs> we are way over time. But it's so interesting that I would love to move this discussion to our networking platform, Wonder. So those of you who would like to continue uh, discussing this topic, this exciting topic, uh, which I'm working also on, uh, please join us in Wonder right after uh, the uh, in the uh, right after this session. Uh, so that brings us to the end of the session and to the end of the first day of the symposium. So I would like to thank all our participants for presenting their ongoing research on climate change. It was a very interesting day. I personally have learned so much. And I would like to thank our audience for joining us and participating, actively participating in the conversation and to Anna and to Douglas at the Force Space for their incredible support. I would like to uh, invite you to join us tomorrow at 10 a.m. Uh, we, we will start our day with a panel discussion on climate change careers, continue with student presentations, and conclude with climate jeopardy workshop that Alex has prepared for you. Uh, so I will post the, the symposium program if it hasn't been. No, yes, Anna was very nice to post the symposium program. So please check uh, tomorrow's schedule and join us tomorrow. And with that, I will end the formal discussion and invite everyone to continue conversation in the networking platform Wonder, if you would like to join us. Thank you very much. And hopefully to see you tomorrow. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you all for the amazing bye. organization. We're lucky to have such a platform. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone, for such a lovely.